All right, cool. Why don't we go ahead and jump in since it is nine o'clock and I know that people are joining us on a Saturday and so that's a whole lot going on here. Uh, what I'll do, um, you're welcome to leave your mic on if you would like um, because I do kind of want to encourage us to chat a little bit while we're in here, okay? Um, one of the things I'm gonna turn on right now is the um, chat overlay so that it is, if you don't want to say something verbally, you would at least have the chat window here in our uh, conversation. And then here in a moment, I'll share the screen so that everybody would be able to see um, kind of what's going on, okay? So, um, wow, we definitely have lots of people. I think 16 folks on the call, it's fantastic. Uh, well, welcome to 3100. Um, so, um, my name is Nick Bowman. I'm an associate professor here at Tech. And this class came together kind of quickly from some experiences I was having over the spring where I was at the National Zhengzhou University in Taipei uh, doing a lot of work on um, virtual reality and um, um, under doing some teaching and then also doing some research to figure out um, how we go about um, engaging these experiences. And so while the Fulbright was unfortunately cut short because of COVID, um, we made a lot of connections uh, with the research team over there. And we're in the process of trying to gather up some uh, more resources, you know, to continue these partnerships. Um, they're doing quite a bit of VR work. We're doing quite a bit of VR work. Many of the folks on the call are part of Tech's new VR, uh, Tech VR Club. And so they're in the middle of trying to establish that presence. I know that like Lindsay and uh, uh, Rizzonato and Koji Oshimura and Phil Chavo, they've been working down in the IX lab to try to rebuild our... Um, gaming and VR equipment. So over the fall, one of the benefits of not being able to collect research data is that we're in the middle of rebuilding our laboratory. And so we're hoping by the end of the calendar year to have, imagine kind of like a loft style environment where folks would be able to walk in the room and it would be a simulated living room. They would have big screen TV, game systems wired up, and it'd be plug and play. So we're, we're taking advantage of some of this downtime to try to rebuild a lot of that stuff. So fun part of this chat working with our students over there is that it all feeds into a larger body of research focused on understanding how people use and experience VR and gaming. Um, recognizing a lot of faces on the call, so really excited about, about that. A couple of you I had in, in 3120, so it's cool to see you back, man. Uh, sorry about the grading snafu this morning. It looks like um, some of you submitted your questions through the assignments. And some of you submitted them through the notebooks. I didn't see the assignments ones. Um, in the future, do it both ways. Um, it's that way I have a redundant network. So when you submit your homework for the people taking this for credit, I'll, I'll see it in the Word file, like in the assignments page. But then don't forget to cut and paste it and put it in your notebook. Um, and that should solve any problems there. I know a couple of you got a little scare this morning when you saw a zero. And you're like, really? I just signed up for a class late. And the semester started and, and I'm failing already and I haven't even gotten a chance to talk yet. So that should be fixed. A couple of them I gave some feedback on just to uh, take an opportunity to try to refine your questions. And um, you can do that in here. Uh, Alex asked if we need, if we need to um, um, send them every week. No, you don't need the emails. It looks like the, um, I'm gonna share my screen. It looks like the um, system for, uh, submitting through Teams is working just fine, other than folks kind of learning a new system. And I definitely apologize for having to learn so many new systems. Uh, the reason we're doing it through Teams is that we have guests joining us. So a couple of the folks on the call are university faculty and staff. A couple of folks on the call are some of our, our master's and doctoral students who are just sitting in as part of the research team. Uh, many of the undergraduates on the call will know that we often will work with undergraduates on research. And so some of the names and faces you'll see in the call are the people you'd be working with. We've got some folks from the library joining us. So I'm overall pretty excited about the opportunity. Uh, because of so many of us, and we don't have that much time, you're thinking three hours is a lot of time, but I won't do formal introductions, but I think we'll meet each other as we go through uh, our six weeks. What I'll ask you to do is the first time you speak or ask a question, introduce yourself, you know, so kind of we know who you are. And then as we do that a couple of times, we'll eventually get to know everybody and then we'll just continue on with the conversations, okay? So this is a really weird experiment. We, we don't normally do 
um, classes with international uh, collaborators and, and do so in a way that um, incorporates the students from one university working with students from another university that's 13 hours ahead of us in the future, right? Um, and uh, different time shifted semesters. So our Zhengda students won't actually start school for I think maybe a couple of weeks from now. So we're actually out futuring their future to talk about the future, to give them content that eventually they're gonna hop in and respond to and then we're gonna chat with. In fact, let me share something with you here um, to make sure we're all on the same page with the syllabus, okay? Um, some of you are wondering how I'm awake this morning, and it's a mix of drinking coffee out of my, I don't know if you can see it, but my, uh, my favorite coffee cup. Um, but also for those of you who have worked with me, I don't ever stop. So it's just the way it's going to be. <laughs> I'm drinking coffee out of my favorite coffee cup too. What do you got? Oh, nice. <laughs> This is a, hey, you, you're finally awake at the bottom. It color changes. I dig it. I dig it. I think the one I need, I need a Gundam. One of these days, I'll finally get one. <laughs> Can everybody see the syllabus okay? Yeah. It's really basic, right? We have six recording days, and that's today. And if you'll notice, I made sure that we never have back-to-back -back Saturdays. That just seems kind of cruel for everybody. So I, I tried to space it out where we have basically two a month, one in November, because I wanted to make sure we don't record during the fall break for us for Thanksgiving, which by the way, I've celebrated Thanksgiving while I was in Taipei one year, and I could talk about that some other time. It was pretty cool. Um, and then we have one recording in December. You'll notice our discussion days. These are the days where you're going to be logging on and talking asynchronously through chat with our students at Zhengda. Those days are later in the semester because they coincide with the Zhengda syllabus for their class. And the idea is that sometime later, uh, Dr. Tammy Lin is going to send you a link to register for a class. There's no cost involved. It's just to get into their, their system so that you can chat on like a chat room board with the students over there. And that will be asynchronous, right? So there will be like a discussion board. The students in Taipei will have had class that week. And part of their class is watching this video they're going to post and talk about things. And then for the folks who are enrolled in the class during that week, you'll need to log on and post and respond to them. Okay. It's all asynchronous. Um, it'll be fun. We'll have more details later. The reason there's only four is just again, because of the way the semesters align, there's not a perfect alignment there. Okay. Grading is real basic. It's reading, posting by midnight on Friday, which gives me Saturday morning to read over everything. Um, just make sure if you're enrolled in the class, you definitely have to be here um, for the recordings. Um, and we, can, we can't miss any because it's only six days. So if you miss one day, that's the class basically. And then the content's all gonna be on Teams, okay? Um, so unless there's any questions about how that is working, I'm gonna go ahead and move into the class itself. Uh, like I said, forgive me, the screen's gonna be a bit cluttered because we're recording things for, for everyone involved here. Okay, um, all right, but I'll try my best to make sure we're not overlapping the content too much. All right, cool. So if we don't have any questions, I'm just gonna kind of jump in, okay? And like I said, we'll do introductions by as we go through the class, the first time you speak up, tell us who you are, and then we'll chat a little more. Um, I've got your questions on another screen, okay? Actually, I was a bit overwhelmed in a good way with how much content you generated. I was like, oh, this will be easy. I'll grab a cup of coffee, read a few questions and like slide them in the lecture. And then I open your notebooks up and, and your assignments and I was like, hmm, that's deep. And that's a lot of deep from a lot of people. <laughs> so I'm gonna encourage you to shove those questions into the conversation. When we get to a point, if it's tapping your question, hit that, okay? Because I have them in front of me but between balancing everything out, I don't want to miss you. So feel free to toss that in there and make sure they're on the same page. And uh, for, throughout the conversation, because of the way we're doing the recording, I might move things around so that um, I can, so everybody can see the screen. Okay, so things get in the way. All right, um, let's jump in. So 
the class is on Game Society. And, and as I was telling everybody through email, first, by the way, I'm really impressed. I'm impressed that 17 people are joining us. I, I think that says a lot about tech, frankly. Like, I don't mean like we're taking credit for your work. I'm talking more the students that go here. Like, this is pretty cool. I think Taiwan was expecting us to have four. So we got a lot of interest here, you know. I'm pretty geeked about this. Um, the courses on games and society, and as I think everyone saw, even in doing the readings today, I'm not a programmer. I mean, I know how to make like RPG Maker, and I can get bored and make some sprites. And back in the day, I used to hack Doom to like put different music in it and stuff like that, or maybe like a like a bully's picture so I could shoot him in the arm or something silly like that. But I'm not a designer. I'm not a programmer. A lot of the work that I do, and a lot of the work that we do in the College of Media and Communication is on the human side, you know, the flesh bag, the person touching the system, why we use it, how it affects us, what we do with the information as a result. You know, Christina Nahara's on the call. She's one of our PhD students who studies risk management. And she's been thinking about how can we use video games to mitigate risk, like with, with risky driving behavior and things like this. You know, uh, Koji Oshimura is a PhD student on the call. And he's been looking at how we use games to understand people's moral decision making and their moral reactions to things. Uh, Lizzie Reginato is on the call, and she's been looking at uh, working with me to see how do students or how do people, when they play a violent game, how do they talk about it? And we're trying to move past just the assumption that the only thing games can do is hurt us. Doesn't mean they can't, but there's a lot more involved in the process of using interactive media. And that's what we're going to talk about throughout the semester. So the point of this class is to give you a scientific, a theoretical base for better understanding what is currently the most profitable and popular and ubiquitous entertainment medium that we currently have on Earth. I think it was about, and Yoji, Koji, maybe you, you have this number. I want to say it was like 15 years ago is when gaming started making more money than Hollywood. And the numbers have never returned. And they just keep going up and up and up and up. And in fact, in a time of COVID-19, gaming is not really hurting. If anything, games are hot right now, right? Because people are getting an incredible amount of, um, of experience when they can't otherwise, you know, engage their world. And we'll talk about what that means, right? And so I gave you the six topics on the syllabus. And each Saturday that we meet is going to talk about a different flavor of gaming and VR experience. My job in the chat is really to facilitate our... Um, the theoretical, the concept idea. And then your job on the chat is to help us work through these things and apply them to something beyond just what we're doing in the class today, okay? I'm gonna leave my email up just in case anybody's having any technical difficulties, okay? And um, today is on a topic that is one of my favorites, because mine, <laughs> it's what I'm working on. It's actually the thing I've been working on the last couple of years. And it's this notion of demands, this idea that, you know, how do we cope and make sense of what's happening on screen? I'm going to dive in. I'm going to lecture for a while. Again, feel free to jump in and I'm going to find points of departure so folks can get their questions in. Um, I'm going to move our camera down kind of towards the corner here. And I'm going to take our participants and move this window away for now. Um, 17 on the call, that's pretty cool. I'm just gonna move this over here. All right. So one of the things about video games is that if they're an ongoing dialogue, okay? Um, what I mean by that, well, you see this picture on screen. What's it implying? When I say that gaming is an ongoing dialogue, what am I implying? Who's having the dialogue? Our brain. Our, uh, our, and I would go even further than that, just say our physiological system, right? But who are we dialoguing with? The program. The program. One of the fundamental arguments um, that a lot of us in game studies have been trying to make is that absolutely, when we think about video games, it's not something you do, it's an ongoing discussion between you and a system. The system presents you with things. You have to respond to those things. And then what does the system do? It 
responds response. to your stimulus? Yeah, the system responds to you responding to it. And in communication, one of the ways we define a dialogue or an interaction is when person A says something, person B says something, person A responds to person B based on prior information. And it's a dialogue. And when you think about gaming is a dialogue between the user and the system. Has anybody watched that documentary High Score on Netflix yet? If you get a chance, uh, um, Fred, you, you mentioned you have. The very first opening frame, they talk about, the, they're interviewing the developer of Space Invaders. Remember this? He was a Japanese man. He developed Space Invaders. And he, he makes this comment that um, the very thing about video games, it's what happens in here. Yes. It's like it's in the, yeah, I love how he starts the dialogue with that. The very beginning of the documentary is games happen in the brain. It's all cognitive. Yeah, yeah. And of course, they use cognitive a little different than we're going to, but I love that idea. No matter how much of the system you program, the games happen in here. They, they're assembled in the brain. But we're going to talk about that a little more here in just a moment, okay? In fact, we can debate when we say something's interactive right? Where is it located? Well, there's two debates. One idea is that interactivity is a product of the technology. So if I go over to my shelf over here, I'm going to grab two controllers that I can quickly get my hands on. So this is a Sega Master System controller. Everybody can see that. Uh, 19, oh man mid 80s okay and this is what what kind of controller is that it's 64 yeah a uh, gamecube actually GameCube. Oh, fuck. yeah yeah this is a All knockoff right. pink gamecube controller that i play ultimate muscle with because it matches the same color as the characters in the game can you can you wave dash no i'm freaking terrible <laughs> at it i don't even want to talk about that right now <laughs> <laughs> you bring up a gamecube controller that's what's going to come up <laughs> Um, see these two controllers from an interactivity is product perspective. Which one's more interactive? The GameCube controller because it has more inputs. Yeah, exactly. From a product perspective, this lets you do more. It can take more of your inputs and put them on the screen. This, this was, this is mine from when I was a kid, doesn't let you do very much. Two buttons. Right? Interactivity is process argues that interactivity is up here. So Jared, that's a fair question. And my answer is hell no, which means when Jared's holding this controller and when I'm holding this controller, do we have the same level of interactivity? No. No. He knows how to do more than I do. I rage quit. I can't wave dash. What's that? I can't wave dash. I was okay, just asking. Can anybody on the call wave dash? No. Okay, Alexander <laughs> is better than all of us at this controller, which means when he's holding this thing, he can do more. He can change more of what's on the screen than what, other, what others of us can. Folks, I didn't even use analog controls until like the mid 2000s. I was totally against the thumb control. Like <laughs> hell no, it's gotta be this or GTFO. Like I was the guy in like still playing Street Fighter 2 with like, you know, I would turn off the analog on my PlayStation controller and just use the D-pad because the whole thing frustrated me. The whole idea that like I can barely move my thumb and my character would run around. I would get angry about this. I need binary, one, zero, one, zero. Of course, those of you on the call shaking your head are like, what a terrible way to play a video game. It's so imprecise. But remember- it's fun. It, it's, it's fun, it's challenging, it's a different type of thinking, but you all get the point, right? Interactivity, we can debate where it exists. My perspective on this, what we're gonna talk about today, is the process of interactivity. It doesn't mean the controller is not important. Of course the system has affordances and constraints that allow us to do variable things. But what I wanna talk about is how we understand the way that the user makes sense of the interactivity that's been placed in front of them. Again, explaining why we can all pick up the same system and some of us can do more than others. 
and that that might be an important consideration as we think about these different control systems. Okay. Um, all right, cool. Just making sure it's not okay. Oh, huh. I just got an email from Walt Williams, who is the writer for Spec Ops The Line about a uh, potential uh, a collaboration. So that's kind of neat. I'll uh, oh, come up later. That, that's, a, that's cool mm -hmm. timing. That's me fan, fan geeking out a little bit. Um, if you all played Spec Ops The Line, it's a neat game. We'll talk about it actually today. All right, so let me move our screens just so you can all see this. And thank you for tolerating my consistent floating things around on the screen. Um, there's some structural reasons why we have to do this. Um, one of the things about demands is we have to realize that when we're playing a video game, games are inherently unfinished. What do I mean by that? That when you buy a game, it's not finished. Any idea what I mean by that? Um, you, oh, I'll, I'll go, I guess. Uh, when it, you mean it's not finished in the respect that when you start the game, you have all of these choice. All these choices have yet to be made. Right, right. You've got to make those choices, right? They're not made for you. They're made as we go. So on screen here, it says what happens next depends on you. What are the things that could happen? So you all probably recognize that uh, that image, right? Mm -hmm. What could happen next? Oh, Any number of Oh, uh, sorry. Remember level one of that of the game? There will be a Goomba coming from the from the right. Here, yeah, here in a moment a Goomba is going to come. And what do you get? What, what do you have to do? Jump. Jump. And what are your options? Kill it. You could or kill it. Dodge. Right? Jump. Dodge just, or die. Yeah, kill, dodge, or die. That's three things. That sounds small, but that's three different experiences. And then you multiply that out by all the other experiences you could have. And your gameplay could be really different depending on those early choices you make. There are pacifist runs. I believe it is possible to beat Super Mario Brothers 1 without ever taking out or hurting a single character with the exception of collecting the axe so Bowser falls in the lava. Yeah, I think so. You know, that's pretty neat. Three. And there's and I ways think the speed runs are like under five minutes too. Yeah, where they, they you know, something. you avoid things in a speed run because you're just trying to move as quickly as you can, right? Um, some people talk about video games as a series of interesting decisions. Um, Sid Meier, uh, the, the developer of Civilization, talked about this, that really all a game is is me giving you stuff to do. And as long as I give you enough things to do, I'll keep you interested. Anybody who plays sandbox games knows what I'm talking about, where sometimes what keeps them, what gets you to stop playing is because you run out of things you want to do, right? Mm -hmm. um, somebody else, Dylan, talked about, yeah, you can die, get a power up, beat the level, and you got to move right for that game. Um, in games, if somebody's crying, there's a good chance you did it, <laughs> and you could probably fix it if you wanted to. Um, games are kind of a twilight zone and where it's weird because you're both a subject in the narrative, but you also play a role outside the narrative to do things, right? How many of you play games where you uh, hop in and you save your game right before something's gonna happen and then you try three or four different decisions? You, know, you put your thumb in the chapter, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. of course. Yeah. In fact, the most frustrating thing about games like uh, uh, Heavy Rain is they don't let you do that. You only get one save file because they want you to make a consequential decision. And we'll, we'll talk about that a little later, right? So yeah, what happens next? Go ahead. Uh, I think uh, this is actually an excellent time for one of my questions. Uh, I don't know if, you'll, if you're gonna touch on it later, but with like with people crying and emotional responses. Uh, oh, by the way, I'm Jared. You said, the, uh, yeah. you said to introduce, yeah, please. I'm, Jared, I'm the president, president of the VR club here at Tech. Uh, yeah, I like VR, so that's where a lot of my <laughs> uh, questions are in, right, for the reference, <clears throat> frame of reference. Uh, responses to sim stimuli in VR seem to be a little more intense from my experiences. How does immersive media such as VR, AR, et cetera, uh, affect the mo player's emotional responses and its effect on the brain. 
let's get <clears throat> down to that one. I have a slide where I'm going to show you some 360 video. If you could hold that question for that slide, I think it will play a role. Absolutely. It's a good question, though. Um, but of course, the question he's asking is, now you're creating and finishing off these, te these texts, and you're doing it in the context of being fully immersed. And we'll talk about that as we go through. But I think we get the idea that not only is a player system dialogue an interaction, that when it's an interaction, it's a demanding one. That system needs you for things, and you need that system for things. This is what makes games fun, I believe, right? Like, that's the fun. I want to touch it. I want to absorb, I want to absorb myself. Like, I still watch movies. I binged Cobra Kai this week. I don't know if anybody's, it's, it's, it's taking Karate Kid and adding Shakespearean levels of drama to it. It's basically Romeo and Juliet with feet and kicking. It's amazing. Um, that's because I wanted to veg out. And I didn't want to do a lot of work. When I want to work, I play different video games, right? And I play different games for different reasons. And that's what makes them fun. But I want to complicate the levels of demand and the dimensions of the demand that might actually affect the experience in ways we're not thinking about. Okay? So let's go through that over the next couple slides. And then we're going to get to Jared's question here in a little bit. Can I make a comment here? Yeah, please. Uh, so... It's very interesting you talk about these, uh, you know, choices and giving players things to do. And I think that very much fits. For example, like, um, interesting is that I'm into flight simulation and a product that was being uh, developed, I don't know if it's out yet, I'll have to check, but they were developing a, like, uh, third-party application for a flight sim where they give you things to do, like a business to run or sure. flight things, because they, they say that free flight after a while gets boring because basically you're flying places with no purpose at all. So the purpose of this thing was to give you a reason to fly and give you actual things to do. And I think that helps. Sure. Uh, um, War, mm -hmm. World of Warcraft expansions, that's the whole point, right? At some point, the game, you run out of stuff. And so they don't just add a couple of things. Usually an expansion is pretty revolutionary. They're like, new narrative this person's bad now you can't have these skills here's a new race of people oh yeah orgamar has a giant hole in it now right and you got to figure all that out again um one of the things that phil is, is studying is this notion of familiarity and how people recognize experiences and prior experiences and make sense of all of that so all of that's an aspect of demand and one of the things i want to talk about today is the dimensions of demand and when they're helpful but also when they may not be so helpful. And that's what we're gonna do now. Okay. So on the screen here, you see four dimensions of demand. Okay. Um, the cognitive, having to think through the systems. The emotional, are you able to see my mouse cursor when I move it? Yes. Awesome, we can. cool, cool. The emotional, which is when you know you have these affective reactions. The physical, which we're gonna break down in terms of physical exertion, like actually having to move yourself, even if that just means buttons and the controllers themselves, and then the social. Okay, we'll talk about all four of these, and that's going to be, and we'll spend a lot of time on emotion in particular, given some of the subject matter they were hoping to have from Shanta. Okay, cool. So this was supposed to animate again. It's a little bit of a glitch with our system. I'll move the video. What am I showing on screen right now? Any First thing I recognize the game. Looks like Contra. It is Contra. Contra for the NES. Yeah, this is where I start to age myself. You have to forgive. Like, I'm not even trying to be retro cool. This is just my experience. Like, is this game? Well, Summoning Saul recently released a, vi a video on the speedrun history of this. I saw game. that one actually. And yeah, that that's for two as well. So Contra. Now, what am I overlaying on? And anybody recognize what level? I'm just curious, like what level this is. This is the very first level. It's the very first boss you fight. You know, in Contra, uh, if you've played the game franchise, good thing for Phil, these blinking red dots are a huge indicator that, of what? Weak point. Weak point. NES games were famous for massive bosses that were far larger than the player. Kind of, and, of course, usually it was a one-hit kill, right? So if you got touched, you were dead. 
And it was meant to scare you a little bit and to make you feel a bit anxious. And a, a lot of these earlier games had very, you know, set patterns. And the, really the goal was to figure out the pattern, to avoid things in the pattern system, and then finally to win. And part of winning was finding a weak spot, right? So what am I showing on screen here? Well, there's a shiny. And whenever I see a shiny, well, that contrasts with the rest of the background. And that contrast has a certain color, and it's usually red. Red means weak. When I hit the weak spot, what happens? Massive damage. Well, before that, because in a lot of these, you're right, Sam, but in these games, you didn't see a, a damage bar. Yeah. But you heard the beep. Mm -hmm. And the beep or the glip or the noise was like, oh, snap, I hit him. He's hurting. That meant it was a shield was going down, then you saw the damage, then it exploded, then I won. Mm -hmm. This is a good example of a mental model where I'm connecting different things in an environment. Like it's not like if I walk outside and there's like a red blinky light on the side of a building at tech, if I start punching it hard enough, the building's gonna fall over. It doesn't work that way. But we did learn in a lot in Contra, for example, this was the mental model that connected this one stimulus to this one action win state. In fact, the Contra series was quite famous for this. The one that came out later on, they, they remade it several times. And one of the things they did in the remake is there's a level where you encounter a wall. And when you shoot that red dot, it shoots back at you with a laser. And Contra players were totally flummoxed because we're like, well, what do we do? That's not how this works. Like the game... <laughs> You're supposed to shoot the red dot, and when you shoot the red dot, it explodes. And now the red dot's shooting back at me. I don't get it. Well, this is a bit of cognitive mapping. Phil, help us out. What's a cognitive model? What's a mental model? A uh, mental model is the structure you have, cognitive structure you have in your head, well, cognitive and emotional of the, of your previous, formed by your previous experiences of knowledge you have with a certain game or property or whatever. So it helps you function in real life, but it's also really powerful in games because games are learning tools and you learn all these different things that work in games and then you can apply that to new games or to other games that you're playing. Right. And so Phil is one of our PhD students who is studying this aspect of gaming and how we make sense of games. This would be an example of cognitive demand, solving the puzzle, putting it together. And in some ways, like the game on screen almost doesn't matter that much. The underlying model is what you're actually testing. Does that make sense? Like the game is, I don't know if anybody on the call is a film scholar, but in film, we talk about MacGuffins. A very famous MacGuffin would be the briefcase in Pulp Fiction or the ring in Lord of the Rings. Any idea why they're called MacGuffins? I'm just curious. Um, they, they're basically an object in the film that propels the plot forward. Right. And on the one hand, you have to have it. Lord of the Rings doesn't work if you don't have a ring to throw in a volcano. But the fact that it's a ring means nothing. Mm -hmm. It could have been a Volkswagen. And besides just not making sense and being hard to carry around, it'd be the same movie. In fact, I want to challenge somebody on the call to remix Lord of the Rings, but it's like Herbie the Love Bug. You know? <laughs> and we got to destroy the love bug to restore whatever. I forget the story. Peace, something, something. Something's wrong. <laughs> Look, it was too long for me. It was very long movies. The book's even longer. I got lost. Wait, have you not watched all of them? No, I've watched them all. I just sort of, I dozed off. I'm like, oh, I get it. The rings in the volcano, four hours of hugging, and then we're done. But that's a personal yeah. critique. That's not a Texas Tech official position on Lord of the Rings. <laughs> that's me being crabby. <laughs> this is recorded, though, and you're an official Texas Tech personnel or faculty, so. Yeah, in my attic. <laughs> um, so cognitive demand could be about forming that model forming that model putting it together and getting us all on the same page right now what's on screen here i'm going to move that gif for a minute gif for a minute sorry what's that portal portal how does portal work you shoot portals and then you go through portals to what end? When you solve rooms by the, using the portals. Right. You got to get out of the room. Just and the room puzzles. is not easy to get out of. Right? Um, and they make really complicated rooms that don't just work like normal rooms. 
And in order to navigate these rooms, you've got to teleport yourself or portal yourself from one of the room to the next. If you've played portal before, how would you get out of this room? Uh, via physics. Yeah, you fall down into like a whole, so, uh, you know, a momentum so that you fall through the blue portal so that you can land. So Level. what's step one? Shoot a portal at your feet at and your then feet? shoot a portal above the platform that you need to land on over there. And then you just okay. fall through the portal and land. And then you go it, through the door. The, 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 the fact, and the this fact that we can answer that without even actually having a controller in our hand is what I'm talking about, right? These mental models are so strong that you only need a couple of cues, like bam, there it is, right? You don't even actually need to be playing the game to solve it. And in fact, here's a solution, right? And of course, he did, this person did it a different way. Theirs is even simpler. Just, boop, I just walked in a portal, assuming that I would come out on this side and then I would fall. But like somebody else said, you can put it on the floor, Right, so not only can we solve these puzzles without even actually playing the game, we can solve them in different ways. Because if you know the mental model, the rest of it comes easy. If I were to go up a slide, I don't stand there when I play this level. I stand here. Usually because I have a spread gun. And if I sit here, the spread gun will hit the jerks up here, the jerks right here, and the jerks right here. But I mean, like, this person will win too. I'll make fun of them, but they're, just, they're still going to win. Right? There's different ways to engage these things. So these mental models, and as Phil mentioned, they can be pliable, but they help you make sense of the future. Right? They help you make sense of the relationships. All right, cool. In video games, performance is largely based on our ability to control the interactivity. And one of the ways we control interactivity, besides learning all of those puzzles, is also learning how to literally engage the content to control the puzzles. In fact, some people would argue that there's really no such thing as game skill. It's just cognitive skill applied to a game. And it's an interesting concept. And we've got some data to support this. If I show you behind the screen here, these skills on screen, 2D mental rotation, 3D mental rotation, your ability to track objects and target them, uh, eye-hand coordination, fine motor skill, your ability to complete words, these are all skills that can be measured outside of a video game. Like I can give you a paper and pencil test. And then when you perform well at these skills, we can predict how well you'll play a video game. And I'll give you an example here on the next screen. Okay. So what kind of game are we playing here? First person shooter type, right? And if you look at what's inside this person's head, what are you seeing? They're viewing obstacles. And they're viewing it in 3D, right? And they're making sense. Technically, there are no 3D games, unless you're talking about immersive VR, right? It's a flat screen that the player has to make sense of. What's below their head is a paper and pencil test called the Vandenberg Crew's 3D Mental Rotations Test, the 3D MRT. And in this test, you show somebody an image, and then you show them four other images. And the idea is that some of these images are rotations of this one, and some of them are totally different images. Well, the only way you can take this test is by seeing something on a screen, making sense of it in your mind, by rotating it conceptually, and then matching them up. Incidentally, anybody know what the answer is? So two of them are rotations, and two of them are wrong. Uh, one and three, it looks like. And, and uh, let's, how, are you folk, how are you determining that? I look at the, I look at the thing. And I mentally rotate it. <laughs> well, so like, for example, if you look at one, well, I can count these two appendages. And this one also has two appendages, right? And you can start counting, okay, well, this one's here. So if I were to take this object and drag it this way, right, these appendages would end up over here, wouldn't they? And so I can see, oh, yeah, that 
is the same shape as this. It requires me in my mind, as Jared said, to take this first object and drag it around, right? People who can do this better play first person shooters better. How, how does that make sense? Because they're able to comprehend an object that changes its uh, appearance via your physical location. Right, and, and it's another way of saying they can look at a flat screen and they can think in 3D, right? They can project in 3D. So when the screen showing you things, people who do well at this test can make sense of what's happening on that screen. Whereas people who don't have this ability have a hard time reasoning in 3D space, even though it's not actually 3D. It looks 3D because of depth perception, but it's not, it's a flat screen. Does that make sense? In fact, we might wonder if this skill is still relevant in VR. In fact, uh, uh, Jared and Avery, that could be a cool study to do. Like, does this skill predict VR performance? One argument being in VR, you're not projecting 3D, that it actually is 3D. But in a way, it's not, because it's still a headset. It's still a flat screen, right? It's just 2D twice. Yeah, and that's where things get tricky, don't they? Which is how we actually see, because both one eye, you don't really have depth perception. Uh-huh. The other, together. I, I could, that would be an interesting study to do, like whether or not this skill actually predicts three, uh, VR performance differently than video game. And Jared, like what you said, it's not 3D, it's basically 2D twice, um, which is why some folks still struggle in VR, because they don't have their proper parallax, and it, and it can be a bit disturbing. Right. I mean, other people have issues because they're too interested in how they appear out on the outside. Well, they, they definitely talk about that. <laughs> the uh, I look like a jackass effect. <laughs> so what is cognitive demand? And by the way, we're going to meet Raider Red. Uh, a friend of mine uh, came up with this uh, 8-bit schematic, and I'm happy to share that with you. I'm really excited to work this into the lab a little more. Um, that's our new logo. So, Lindsay, that's our new logo. <laughs> Um, cognitive demand is the extent to which uh, the user is required to explicitly or implicitly make sense of, rationalize, or understand the environment. Okay. A couple of folks in the chat, by the way, jumped in and they were right. One and three are the correct ones. Um, and oh, Jeremy asked, uh, could this be seen as wireframe uh, image? A lot of folks do sometimes try to unrender what they're seeing on screen to rotate its bones. Um, I know there are a lot of more elite gamers that will intentionally turn off the graphics in a first person shooter to up the frame rate to be able to more quickly respond to what's happening on screen. Sorry, I'll move this chat over so I can see it a little better. Uh, sorry for the folks on the chat. Okay, so cognitive demand is the system requires you to make sense of it. And of course, that one is probably the easy one. Right, that's the one that we expect. And the point is there are, and that's when I did my research, when I first started studying video games, that's where I started, it's cognitive demand. But there's more, and now those are the ones I wanna talk about now. So what is going on here? Cuphead. It's Cuphead, why would I show Cuphead? Because Cuphead is really hard. It is very hard, <laughs> but we're past cognitive demand now. But you're right, this game is very hard. <laughs> Understanding and reacting accordingly to what's going on. So this one, that's not wrong. It's just silly. Eh. Why did they choose this aesthetic? Of all the choices they could have made, why this one? Because cartoon aesthetics. Cartoons are fun. Avery, what'd you say? Uh, I said, because when you die to like a flower, it makes you more frustrated with the game. Possibly. I'm going to argue they were going for something very different. It's just whimsy, nostalgia, fun. It's a silly game. This animation style is from the 1920s. And if I'm not mistaken in this game, they hand animated the game. Mm -hmm. The developers drew all of this by hand. And it was a shout out to sort of a bygone era of um of entertainment so one argument about games is they are spaces that allow and somebody did mention like you're getting attacked by a giant flower 
Games are spaces that inspire us to play, period. I don't know if like if you're walking to campus and like somebody wore a flower costume and started doing this, that you would really engage it in the same way you would, you know, in a game, right? Um, the movie wouldn't quite make sense, but maybe in a game environment, you can play and have fun with it. So, so we can start with the notion from an emotional perspective that just the aesthetics and the images here engage us in a bit more playful of a manner. That doesn't invalidate the idea that this game was super hard and had some cognitive demands associated with it. Funny enough though, and Phil, thinking back to familiarity, every time you shoot that flower, what's it do? Flashes. It flashes. Sounds like they're engaging a mental model of platformers. They were faster than me at responding. What's that? You're quick on the trigger over there on the mute button. I'm not saying, uh, actually, I don't have it turned on or off. I think he's talking to me. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. Okay. Students, yeah. <laughs> gotcha. What about what's happening here? A quick time event. Quick time event. Um, how's it supposed to make you feel? Uh, if you do it well, nothing. If you do it poorly, frustrated. Okay, take put it in the context of what's actually happening on screen. Fear, anxiety. I'm getting chased by a dinosaur. <laughs> like. That's intense. Um, this may seem tame today, but I remember in the mid 2000s, oh, actually, gosh, maybe it was 90s when Tomb Raider first came out and you were this uh, Tomb Raider armed with, and what, what are your weapons in Tomb Raider? Pistols. Pistols, really, unless you found the shotgun. Yeah, until you find that shotgun, two really weak pistols. And you're out in the jungle in the very first level of Tomb Raider. You're just like shooting dinosaurs here and there. It's not that big of a deal. And you shoot them once or twice and they fall over. And then you turn the corner and this massive T-Rex starts chasing you. And you've got like a single shot gun. And you you don't have many options. You, you could, you know, what do you do first? You try to shoot it and, and, and you can't do much with it. This is the quick time version of that event. But in the original game, you basically had to either learn how to backflip and shoot at the same time and do that for like 45 minutes until you finally put enough bullets in this thing that it fell down. Or like Sam mentioned, there is a hidden gun in the web in the level. If you find the hidden gun, it's a hell of a lot easier to shoot the T-Rex and you're also not nearly as terrified. But there's that knee jerk reaction where you're like, ah, dinosaur, I gotta run. That's a flight or flight reaction, which is not too dissimilar from reality. There's a fear reaction. And I don't mean fear as in like you were scared for days. You eventually figured it out and fought back. But games have a really strong ability to instill fear. I'm going to die. I'm going to lose. I don't want this. It can eventually turn into frustration for other reasons, of course. But that's another thing that can happen. There's a lot of research. And of course, there are games that are designed to instill fear, like horror games, but even just in regular action games. So Torben Grodal writes about, you know, when you're playing a video game, your brain doesn't distinguish between digital fears and physical fears. We don't have like a virtual section of our minds that go, oh, that's not real. Never mind. Don't worry about it. Now we can eventually rationalize and realize, no, I'm not going to die in the same way I would die in real life if this thing ate me. But our initial reaction is a startle. It's a fear. It's a deep emotion. And we react to that emotion. It's why media worked. If media didn't have emotional reactions, they wouldn't work very well, right? If you went and saw a movie and you didn't actually care what was going on screens, it's all fake anyways. I mean, how many of you have that friend you won't take to the haunted house because they ruin it? And they're like, oh, this is all fake. Like, we know. We, we know. We freaking know. Shut up. You know, we'll get there. But I'm going to the haunted yeah, that, house. What's that? That sort of thing. I actually have no problem with, like, horror games normally. But with VR, like, and being surrounded, you can't look away. You have right. to close you close your eyes and the audio, so the 3D audio, there. and it's like that. That gives gives me a that gives me more anxiety than sure. Literally, anything. because your body is going to have an even harder time separating out this distal on screen versus it's happening to me. 
And that's a hardwired program. It's, it's healthy for us to be afraid of threats because the, 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 the other side of it is you don't, you aren't afraid of the threat and then you actually die when it's a real threat. Again, that sounds dramatic, but that's why these things work, right? There's a lot of research on the media equation that talks about how we tend to react to um, stimulus in media as if they were real until they give us a reason not to, right? Um, another one here um, is something like this. You know, what kind of emotions could be stirred up doing this? Joy. Who's on side drawn? Frustration. So some folks talk about it being fun, right? What do you have to know to pull off a fatality? Specific button inputs right. along the lines very, of like very specific very quick skill succession. sets. In fact, these early fatalities were kind of like Easter eggs, right? They were hidden within the game mm -hmm. to where like only really good players could do them. But of course, what's another emotion that could happen from this? Disgust. Disgust. You can just think this is horrible. Right? Or aggression. Right? Yeah, I'm super pumped now. I'm going to go punch something. Right? These are all things that could happen. And of course, different people will process this differently. Right? So some folks might get really aggressive. Some folks might get disgusted because they don't like this kind of stuff. Some folks might, it's a, it's a sign of joy and pride because you won. And this is like your reward for winning is I'm also going to tear your head off of your head or your body. And of course, the spine's gonna dangle and drip some blood here and there, because why not? You know, we need all of that in the experience, right? These are all different types of emotions. Some of them can be high arousal, some can be low arousal, some can be positively valenced, some can be negatively valenced, right? If we go a little further, we got this famous one, right? What were they trying to go for emotionally? Sad. Sad. And of course, why do we kind of mock it a little bit? Because, because it is a moment that's supposed to be really serious and sad and you're supposed to connect to the character, but instead it's just press F to do this <laughs> very right, like, important thing. We know narratively what they were going for. A very poignant scene to reflect on this character's passing. But the way you do that is go, boop. <laughs> it's so ridiculous. And, and you it's know, even like, what's that? Sorry, it's even got, got like still gotten through. It's still in modern gaming. Oh, culture. yeah. This won't go away. This will not go away. I am waiting for the person to do this at an actual funeral and think it's funny and people go, hmm. please, please don't push F. Please, please don't push F. But it's an evolution towards, in the past, our emotions from games came from the play. They came from the below the neck verbs that got us engaging the experience. And now we're writing in more narrative structures where the ludic dimensions, the play dimensions, the interactive dimensions from this aren't what drives the experience, right? What's supposed to drive your, your sorrow reaction to this death? It was your player character's avatars. Right. From it's your so narrative, it's the narrative container. It's the movie aspect. It's the connection, which may not necessarily be tied to the inputs. This is where games are evolving to be more serious and to trigger more somber emotions, but it's a bit challenging because the, we're still learning how to do it in a medium in an authentic way, if that makes any sense. Uh, there, there's a theory that I didn't have you read about. Oh yeah, Alex, tell us about uh, and you're right, I remember Conan O'Brien doing this one. i just be like, what just happened, you know? Um, there's an argument from a scholar named Ian Bogust, and he talks about procedural rhetoric. And the idea is that in video games, one of the challenges we face is that the rhetoric of the game, the argument, what's in front of us, also has to match the input procedures, because otherwise there, there's a break there, you know? Pay respects by pushing F, it, it breaks it down a little bit. But there are other games that do it really well. Who recalls this scene? Oh. Yeah, a lot of folks have a very strong reaction to this one. Good, bad, or ugly. <laughs> this is the famous Call of Duty uh, 2 Modern Warfare, no Russians level, where at the time, out of the blue, it's like, all right, 
let's go kill some civilians. And players did it and then felt really weird about it. And so Lindsay right now is in the middle of scraping Reddit forums with Phil's help to figure out how folks reacted to this thing. Um, anecdotally speaking, it seems as if not everybody was happy. Some folks were outraged because it was like, how dare you make me the bad person? Some folks talked about moral conflicts in terms of, I don't know how to process what just happened. Some folks thought it was super deep and cool. There's all sorts of emotions that stirred up here. Because, and which is interesting because you've got a game where how many people have you killed in Call of Duty 2 in your history play? Yes. Like a lot. You've been shooting fools for years. And all of a sudden you felt guilty for it. And that was kind of a new thing at the time. And we could debate how it worked out, but there are games that are now playing with this mechanic where you do things under one context and then you get another context. And suddenly the game is making you question yourself. That's pretty remarkable for a medium. I mean, films have certainly done this where we show you content on screen that you're not meant to celebrate. Schindler's List, Hotel Rwanda, Life is Beautiful. We can go through films that have shown you vile things not to celebrate them, but to get you to pay attention and to critique it. So the next step is, okay, let's do it in a video game. I mean, I can imagine a Schindler's List video game. It, it, as odd as that sounds, if you want to teach these things. And of course, we're seeing in VR, where we're starting to see simulations. Uh, there's a relatively infamous one where they simulate waterboarding in a VR environment, um, where you are waterboarded, and then you actually waterboard somebody else and torture them. And it was developed by a group that is trying to uh, get people to realize, like, before you have an opinion about torture, why don't you see what it actually is? Now, we can't waterboard you for lots of ethical reasons, but we can give you the experience. Uh, Sam asked that they made this mission skippable. They did actually, um, but they, they made this because people were so mad. And some people argue it was a bit clumsy because the mission had nothing to, like you could skip the mission and you didn't lose any storyline. And so there were some debates around, was this just sensational or did we really need it? But the point I'm making is the fact that you felt something beyond arousal and enjoyment was kind of a new thing in AAA top of the line gaming systems. And we've seen an evolution since then of more and more games giving you this emotional reaction that is decidedly intense, that's a bit more somber and poignant. And it's sort of like not what most folks paid for. Right? We're not used to being forced to reconcile our emotional labor. One of my questions kind of relates to what we're talking about. Cool, sure. Um, so one of my questions was the fact that a lot of games use narrative to emotionally connect. Because you can get emotionally, um, you know, get emotions out of playing games, but a lot of times they like to use narrative, you know, the, the story structure to get emotions out of you. But a lot of times, as we discussed, like with um, the Call of Duty, that can also fail. So like my question was, um, like what are some other possible examples of where it may fail? Because because my particular example I can think of is um, Last of Us 2. Walk us through it a little bit if you don't mind. Okay, uh, with my example of Last of Us yeah. 2? Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Okay, so the reason Last of Us 2 doesn't work, and I I haven't technically played it, I've seen my sister play it and I've seen gameplay and I know the, the why people don't like it is because one, it tries to get you emotionally invested in a character who you can't, which is Abby. And the reason you can't is because um, she does things that are very questionable without getting too much away in case no one wants to get okay. spoiled. Um, you feel like she's morally ambiguous, like you don't know if she's being good or bad? He does something very sadistic. Okay. She very does a very evil sadistic. thing at the very first hour of the game. Cool. Yeah, okay. and then and then the game likes tries to play like, oh no, she's an old person. Like, she did something very sadistic i don't think i i'm like I, I can't get on board with this you know human you know humanizing 
this Abby character or, you know, that kind of deal. Uh, and also the way the structure, the story is played out can be like switch from character to character also is uh, the structure is wonky, which makes the story f flow. So what is that the character does something that could be reprehensible? Yeah. One is that, okay. One is that it's not always clear who the main character is slash you're balancing out several characters. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. You know, in, in, in that way, it's just like, they try to humanize a character that we are like, that honestly no one can, they, they hate her. <laughs> and they're just like, no, I don't care about mm -hmm. you. That's the problem most people have with the, with that angle. So Koji, why don't you tackle that first part and make sure you introduce yourself so we know who everybody is. Uh, Javier Smith is an undergrad CMI major, right? Yeah. And yeah. Uh, was one of my 2130 students. And, and so was Afrika, also 2130. And I think that was the only two from last semester. Koji, help us out with that first part. So to be clear for everybody on the call, the idea um, is that you had this main character who we assume you're supposed to really care about, but the character does something pretty early on that could be seen as unredeemable. And so how am I supposed to spend the rest of my time with this media property when I don't like this character? Help us out, Cody. Yeah, so um, like Dr. Broman said, I'm a doctoral student here in the College of Media Communication. My research is largely on morality in media entertainment. Um, and I have uh, looked quite a bit at anti-heroes and morally ambiguous characters in media and how we identify with them and enjoy them. And um, one thing that strikes me is I'm not really familiar with the game necessarily, but one thing that strikes me is you brought up that this thing that the character does is very early on in the game. And so um, oftentimes what we look at when we're looking at morally ambiguous characters are um, how players identify with them um, or have parasocial relationships with them. Um, and so I think that um, one aspect could be the event happens very early in the game as you're just forming your impression of the character, as you're just um, getting to know the character. And so it sort of inhibits your ability to form that identification with the character and to form a stronger relationship with the character. Um, and then also, um, it could just be such a strong moral vi moral violation that it results in, um, uh, Dr. Bowman might have to help me with uh, this, but what uh, Ron Tamburini refers to in his model of intuitive morality as, um, uh, it's like an overriding of the other moral foundations. Um, and so what happens is it's such a strong moral violation that it sort of um, uh, set, it sort of sets the stage for every other thing every other thing that the character does is sort of seen through that lens um, and um, based on um, it's such a strong violation that you're focused solely on that dimension of morality. Do we think that was intentional that that's what the developers were trying to do? Yes. Maybe well, the part about making her too bad. Yes, the director has exactly said that they tried to make her dislikable. Interesting. So this is a debate. So what Koji was talking about is that we know that morally complex characters can potentially be very emotionally engaging. And Koji, forgive me if I, if I double step on you here. I lost audio for a split second. Um, is that they do make us think a lot more, right? When you have somebody who is questionable, it engages us in a much more morally complex way, an emotionally complex way. And I could see one argument just being, they wanted you to continue to come back to this. And like, she has this anchor behavior. And I guess one, one thing I might suggest is that most players are probably going to assume that because your character is Abby, that she's going to eventually redeem herself. Um, we see this a lot like in, in your classic narrative structure, like think about most movies you watch. Doesn't the protagonist eventually win? Like eventually save themselves? Think about like your, your characters, like, like uh, Dexter, for example. Like eventually the person does things where you're like, okay, I get it. And maybe what's interesting is in this game, they chose not to. Like, haha, suckers, you thought she was going to redeem herself and she never did. No. That could There's be interesting. Angle. 
there's What's another that? angle about this um, as well, real quick, um, is that the game, the Last of Us 2 tries to get you to feel bad for um, people you kill um, in, in a way, because like if you shoot someone, then maybe somebody else who you're fighting will shout their name like, Mike, no, or um, or like it's like you sh or like if you take out a group of people and there's one person left here, I mean they're gonna then they're like begging for their life, but it doesn't really work because the second you like turn around and stuff, they're gonna try to shoot you. It's just like it's like it, it kind of takes you out of it because every you can, that happens like almost every single time. Like, so another the, question is, are her behaviors worse than other people's behaviors in the game? <laughs> Because one yes. thing often comes up is that, that that's something that, that can trigger emotions. Because if they're not, she's a hero. If they are, you have to grapple with this. I would suggest that this is an example of a game where they were shooting for very strong emotional demands. Like, we want you to play this, as Alex mentioned. We want you to question yourself and who you really are. We want you to do this while you're supposed to be helping others or doing these other things and carrying this weight around. That's a very, now, is this new in films? No. Not really, like, there are films where the main character carries around like deep, dark skeletons. We just never had to like play as the main character for 10, 20, how many hours did you play through Last of Us 2, if you had to guess? The game um, is 25 hours long. 25 hours of being this, person that on the surface is doing one thing and below the surface has the capacity for evil. I think it's two. Um, because Abby is in Last of Us One. So maybe in the beginning the scanner trying to be like this isn't the same Abby you remember. Abby's not in Last of Us One. Huh? She's not in Last of Us One. Oh never mind then. So these parts are intriguing. Go ahead, Jared. And also, you play as her, I think, in the last 10 or so hours of the game, not the first half. It interchanges the protagonist. You play as this one character, and then you play as Abby, uh, and there's this one section where you play as Abby for 10 hours yeah. straight. Well, so there's another layer. We're not used to being the bad person, period. Like, most games don't cast you as the bad person, and when they do, it's because other people are worse. Think of Grand Theft Auto. Like, you're not a good dude, but everybody else is worse. Mm -hmm. They're like the least vile of the other vile people, which is one classic way of allowing you to still enjoy and play the game, right? So these are all things we can think about when we're talking through. A lot of chat on Zoom about animals in games, um, providing different sources of emotions, whether it's just levity or connection with them. Um, and those are kind of interesting. Um, we can definitely think about how the role that companions play in games, you know? Whether it's an animal or whether it's a human companion, we have games where you know you are taking care of somebody else, right? Um, and I think the point we're making here is we're starting to see development grow to trigger a much broader set of emotional reactions. That we can't just assume that games are just distractions. There are some games that are more emotionally involving than some films. And they're intentionally so. And maybe 10, 15 years ago, this was still kind of weird and new and one-off. I'm not sure it's one-off anymore, right? I'm not sure it's just like a thing that sometimes happens so much as an important part of the experience. This is a big issue in VR where we want to have, and this is the question that Jared asked that we're going to come to here in a little bit. We want to have these deep emotional, you know, the assumption is if I'm wearing the helmet and I'm in the system, it should be even more emotionally connecting. But we're actually finding there are some barriers that can reduce it. Now, something you talked about right now is the barrier being narratively. I just can't reconcile liking the bad person. But I guess one of my answers for Javi and Alex is that's okay. Like, in fact, that's what they're going for, as Alex pointed out. Like, yeah, we want you to feel something different. Just like that guy in Call of Duty 2 Modern Warfare, I think the famous quote from the No Russians level was, I just wanted the player to feel something. You know, like players don't usually have these reactions. I thought it'd be neat to give them a reaction that they definitely weren't expecting to have, right? Um, one complaint I often see is that the choices for morality in particular are just so blunt. 
where it's just like you can pet this puppy or disembowel it right and you see these choices that are so over the top fable gets critiqued for this do you want to like steal all the old lady's money or bake her a cake and you're like well and there's even research suggesting that players are so used to being penalized that a lot of players will always make the good decision first out of fear that if they make the bad decision, the game will penalize them. Like that you won't get the full experience if you only make good, if you make bad choices. Um, that's starting to go away. We're starting to see more experiences where games have forking paths and they're narratively rich. Um, Alex posted a little later about, you know, but you're supposed to like Abby. Part of this, I think what I'm arguing is it doesn't matter that much. So there's a famous literary theory uh, from Roland Barthes called The Death of the Author. Alex Sackis heard me talk about this in class uh, earlier this week, where in some ways the author's intent isn't that important. What's important is that the author hands it over to you and then you make your own decision. Going back to that idea with games are co-constructions, they're unfinished texts. We adopt this readily in, liter in literary theory. We adopt this in film theory. We need to adopt it in game theory as well, that you have to let the player make their own experience. So when Sid talks about making interesting decisions, well, what's more interesting than the decision that you make that determines your outcomes? As, as Sam said, Bioshock kind of comes to mind where they were trying, it was brand new at the time, but it was kind of clumsy. Both Sam's talked about this. Like, Bioshock's fun, but like, harvest or help. Like, it was a little girl cowering in front of you. It's like, do you steal her energy or do you help her? Right? Well, come on. <laughs> well, either way, you got the same amount. Wow. What's that? Yeah, either way, if you saved, if you would be rewarded with the same amount you would get from harvesting pretty much. Well, in effect, there's some research on this that depends on what the reward system is. So some games give you choices, but they clearly reward one choice over the other. They give you more for saving. You get like reward like uh, abilities, like you can trick the big daddies into going away from the little sisters for like a couple seconds and like make them like give you a little bit more time with them. And it's like, okay, um, what happens if I harvest? Oh, they hate you more. <laughs> Like, well, and of course, not really helpful. This is a great example of ludic dimensions and emotional cognitive demands and emotional demands clashing. Because should you be making moral decisions based on which one gives you more money, points, power? Well, we could debate that, right? Like in a video game, those things mean something different than in a real world experience. Or, you know, when those things break, you know, the game, you know, you can play Grand Theft Auto by driving the speed limit and stopping at stoplights. People do it online, but the game doesn't give you anything for doing that, right? So if someone makes those decisions, they're not being incentivized in any way. So we can talk about where these things might potentially clash sometimes. Uh, Matt, uh, one of our colleagues fr from tech libraries talked about how, you know, Mass Effect 1 had differing choices as well. You're rewarded for being bad sometimes, and it even gave you a feeling of accomplished, even if you didn't choose like the best option. You know, we're seeing a lot more of that. Of course, from a writing perspective, it's hard because you have to write all those different potential choices into the system. But I think you all get the point. And it's this discussion of that emotions and games are becoming much more complicated. And I think it's to the benefit of, of, of the medium. It's to the benefit of our experiences. And now we're able to have this much richer set of emotional reactions that maybe 10, 20, 30 years ago were totally outside the wall. By the way, films did the same thing. Does anybody on the call know what the first film was of? I mean, the like, train coming at you? No, actually, that's an early one, but it wasn't the first. First film was a horse running. Oh, yeah, that. That's it. The Moybridge film. It was Luke just to prove a point. To prove a point. He just wanted to prove to people that when horses run, they, Avery, Hugo lied to me. Well, I guess film could be defined lots of different ways, right? But one of the very first films was this notion of, uh, it was just a horse running on screen to see whether or not when it runs, if its feet leave the ground, right? 
I think we'll talk about it a little later, but the point is just this idea that um, media evolve. And as they evolve over time, the things we can do with them also evolves over time. Games have been evolving for a long time. And we've gotten to the stage now where it's not ludicrous to think about having the Shakespeare video games. Keep in mind that those early directors who were filming horses running and trains coming at people, those are just technological gimmicks. No one, if you would have asked a film director in the 1890s if you could make a serious story out of a film, they would have laughed at you. But the film evolved over time. Games are evolving now as well. But as we're seeing, there's already a challenge between make, I mean, think about the basics of playing a game where you have to grapple with solving puzzles and also you know, solving your internal moral demons at the exact same time. Like that could get frustrating. And we'll talk about that here in a little bit. Okay. This one here, another image. Um, what do you think when you see this image? I'm just curious. I, oh, go ahead, Jared. You can go ahead. No, no, that was just it. big. Big, sure. Yep. What else we got? I was thinking in my brain, because I'm used to playing a lot of tactical games, I went, is that thing a threat? Is the big robot yeah. a threat to you? That's sure. what my first thought was. This game got a lot of credit for its environment. People, people talked about this environment being lush, full, lively. Uh, some folks said awe-inspiring, where you're walking around, and you're not just like, rocking around after dinosaurs like you're the small thing in this massive world and you can see for miles we're starting to see environments that inspire all in fact big is what's meant to be inspired here and of course by those things being big you're quite small um this was hard to think of a, a while back you know there are some older games like i think shadow of the colossus was another example where mm -hmm. you were the small character but the idea of having awe from a game was a relatively new thing. So we're seeing that now also. We could go on and on about the different emotions that come out of game. But the point is, they are varied, and there's lots of them. And we can talk about emotional demands as the extent to which a video game causes people to have implicit or explicit reactions, emotional reactions to what's happening. We're not always actively having these things. Some of those emotional responses like our gut reactions. Somebody said earlier, you see a violent action, you don't like it, and you just have this like trigger reaction. It's very quick, okay? Uh, Avery talked about playing the game, like just walking around the environment for hours and just being like, what is going on here? Um, absolutely. Yeah, I've been all the world. Yeah, I mean, literally, it's just like, what is this? Then there are some games where I still, oh, Red Dead Redemption, I think somebody mentioned it in the chat, and I recall playing Red Dead Redemption, and I was telling my class, I think I was telling y'all on 21.3, yeah. I'm like, I still haven't left the first world, because I just ride around on my horse. Go on your horse and save people. And save people, and to me, it reminds me an awful lot of, like, like outside of Lubbock. So, like, when I'm riding around, I'm like, hey, it's like Lubbock 100 years ago, cool. There's jackrabbits and coyotes and apparently rapacious cowboys and all those things I can interact with, right? Um, how about the Wii U? And there's lots of other uh, great conversations in the chat. All right, so physical demands. Thanks for hanging in. Video games are a lean forward medium. What does that mean, lean forward medium? Um, you can choose to put more effort into it and you have to be active while you do it. Yeah, I mean, you've, you know, there's always the joke of the kid like playing the racing game and doing this. And of course, does that help at all? I mean, it might help you, but it doesn't. Your controller doesn't know that you're leaning around, right? Okay, what, you uh, want excuse me, what about the Wii? Well, the Wii would be different. We'll talk about that in a minute because it actually is an accelerometer, right? Um, but in fact, that would just be an example of, yeah, you actually can lean forward, right? But the idea, of course, is that this is something that you have to physically do things. It's not enough just to think through a puzzle. I mean, we all played Portal about an hour ago. But we didn't really play Portal. We just talked about playing Portal, and then Portal happened, and then we moved on, right? Which is cool. In fact, many of us who do play games and use VR, we solve the puzzles in our mind as we're walking around, you know? Um, there's even research on this called Persistent Gaming Effects. Um, 
But the idea here is that games also demand us to lean into them, to push the buttons, to actually interact with the things. Um, they re and they require consistent physical input. It's not enough just to do it once or twice. Has anybody on the call ever tried to play a game and do something else? You can yes. do it. Fuck. What's that? Is that talking to people? No. It's sometimes hard. It's yeah. really hard to play a game and do something. I've tried before. I've like, tried to like... Um... Go the thing ahead. that pops in mind for me is Assassin's Creed because it literally is just like this map doesn't exist yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's not. It's it can be tough, you know. Um, games require a lot of attention and a lot of physical input. There's even some games. One of my favorites is there was a Major League Baseball game where um, the, the the game could sense when you weren't looking at the screen, and if it did, it would like try to pick you off at first base. Or like try to throw you a fast. Like it's pretty wild. It was just like a situation to where it was tracking you and like, oh, he's not paying attention. You know, boom, picking you off. Games where you like you put the controller down for a second and you know after like ten minutes or something, the protagonist will say something like, mm -hmm. "Oh, I'm sure bored standing here or something." I like used that. to have an image Riley yes. of Sonic who would uh, in Sonic One, if you did that long enough, he would actually kill himself. Oh God! The, uh, he, oh. Sonic would stop. He'd tap his feet, look at his watch look back at you, tap his feet some more, and if you didn't touch the controller, Sonic just jumps off the screen and you lose a life. <laughs> oh, I, I remember that. seeing a clip yeah. of that. I didn't You're know like, what just happened? And it's like, fine, you're not gonna play? Get out. And of course, it's a funny pun, but it kind of makes sense. Like, games require you. And again, today is, I know we're going back to some crazy basics, but that's kind of the point. It's to go back to things that we're not giving enough attention to to better understand the player's experience of these things in a way that's a bit more theoretical and it can use, be used to predict things down the road. So on screen here, you see a lot of controllers, right? Oh, Jeremy Smith talked about Gran Turismo and the endurance races. Has anybody tried those yet? These are the 18 hour races where you're literally driving like a Lama. I got a buddy up in Michigan who does race for a living and he plays these in his spare time. And like, I can't call him on the weekends because he's racing all weekends, like he's 18 hours. That's a lot of demands, you know. Um, what's on screen? A bunch of controllers. What do they all have in common? Buttons. Buttons, Buttons what else? They have to be methods of input. Mm -hmm. They've got to be held by hand too. And actually, the Wii mode's not a good one for this one. Um, there's this interesting phenomenon in gaming called the Golden Hands Rule, and it's that for gamers, for the most part, when we think of what you use to play a video game, we think of this controller, right? We think of that physical device because we've been using it for so long. What are some of the things you have been able to accomplish with this handheld controller? What are some of the actions you've performed before? Save the world. Yeah, more discreet, <laughs> just like individual actions. Now I've got my computer. Dig up fossils in Animal Crossing. So I've collected fossils. What else have I done? Break out of jail and escape us too. I've breaking out of jail, I've escaped us Pick locks. Take walks. Uh, just like the simple things like being able to move while also looking or changing the camera direction. Move and looking. I mean, Shoot me, guns. I've, I've won the World Series. Um, I pulled off a skateboard mall grind that went on for three minutes and netted me a couple million points. I've flown aircraft. I've driven submarines, um, casted magic spells on the call, aimed and shot an arrow into the guard's knee from Matt. I love it. We've done a lot. I've manipulated blocks falling from the ceiling so that they align with other blocks. I've cured viruses. You get my point. These controllers were designed to be intentionally abstract so that all the player had to do was learn how to hold this thing. And they could trust that part of the game's design was for you to learn the models associated with what these buttons do. 
I mean, these two buttons did a lot for me as a kid. Right over there, I've got Michael Jackson's Moonwalker, where I can toss a coin into a jukebox, moonwalk into a gangster uh, riddled bar, and save kids from whoever the hell. I think his name is Mr. Big. Then there's a game called Penguin Land, where I push an egg around a planet and peck out the ice below it, and then the egg falls through the ice, but it can only fall three units at a time, and there are polar bears trying to smash the egg. And then there are eagles that drop bricks on the egg. And then there's a game called Transbot, where I'm a spaceship, and based on what letter of the alphabet I collect, I turn into a different spaceship. We do a lot with these controllers. They're very abstract, and they're really strong models of behavior for us. The golden hands refer to the games that are designed to fit those hands. Systems like the Wii, many VR and AR systems have challenged this, but they've also had challenges because a lot of folks have a hard time breaking this model. This is such a learned and fundamental way of playing a game. Well, we've done several studies where we give people a new controller and they still prefer the old ones. I'm gonna to go to the next slide and talk about this a little bit. So what's on screen right now? You've got someone playing tennis and someone shooting a gun. You would think that that bottom controller where I can, the Wiimote, where I can move my hands. How do I hit a tennis ball with the Wiimote? What do I do? Swing your arm. You swing your swing. arm. And you, and you, you don't, do you have to learn that? Not really. No, it's intuitive. You, it's pretty intuitive. And even if you don't know how to play tennis, you get the general idea that you move your arms and you hit stuff. No, nah, you don't even need to move your arm, you just need to move the wrist. And we can talk about that, of course. But I mean, um, the uh, general idea is you move something, right? One of my questions I think fits here. Um, well, let me finish the example first, and then we'll go to the question, right? Um, okay. and, and Sam, actually, hold that one, too, after Jared, because we're going to talk about what you just said. You move, the screen moves. That seems pretty natural. We refer to that as natural mapping. And the, it's the extent to which your movements and inputs correspond to what happens on screen. If you don't have to learn a model, it's probably pretty natural. It's built to the human perceptual system. How do I fire a gun? It's a little more complicated, but you can see the hand motions down below, right? Have you ever played a shooting game with the Wiimote? I played one in VR. It was like Call of Duty. Yeah, the general idea is you point at the screen and pull a trigger, just like you would a gun, right? At a, at a rudimentary level, it matches. Yet when we do research on these things, people will say that the, the purple controller is more natural than the Wii controller. Forget for a moment that it's not perfect. Why do you think they say that? Because they're more used to the GameCube controller than they are the Wiimote. The thing they're holding in their hand, and related to that, in their mind, they're not playing tennis or playing shooting games. What are they doing? Shooting a gun or performing playing game video action. Games. They're just, I'm playing games right now. And so the mental model we have for video games is a video game controller. Because we've learned over time that these game controllers can do thousands of things. So they're not, I'm going to go shoot Nazis. That's the narrative, but it's, I'm playing video games right now. Right, and this is the thing you use to play video games with, some version of this. So Jared, ask your question and then Sam follow up because I think we're gonna complicate this. Um, it's virtual reality, it uses kind of a hybrid of the motion controllers and the classic controllers for most consumer systems. I can go grab my controller, the one I use, uh, the one I have is you know, the Oculus CV1, so it's like a split Xbox controller. Um, the physical demand is, obviously physically active it's higher but what about the perceived demand by the player like for not realizing you're tired till after you play because i've i've had long sessions and i not realized i was tired till after how so, does and so is the question like do players realize that it's more work yeah what what's what's this effect like what What's behind it or 
Well, I, th I think that's the question. I don't know if we know that empirically, that players might actually exert more physical effort in a VR system and not be as aware of it. I can see reasons for that. Um, when you walk to campus and back, are you always very well aware of how much effort that takes? Not always. Sometimes. Probably not, because it's just part of your routine. I just know roughly how long it is. Step, go ahead. I just know roughly how long it takes. To get sure. There. But I mean, like, if it's just part of your day, like, I have to walk to the building and back, it's not that it's not effortful. It's just that we don't think about it that much, because it's just part of, that's just part of my day, right? I get up, I go mm -hmm. to campus, and I come back, right? But if you were playing Grand Theft Auto, and let's say Texas Tech University's campus was in the game, and you had to walk back and forth to the buildings, would you be more aware of how, how far you're walking? Yes. You might yeah. be, because it doesn't fit your model as much. Games don't usually make us walk for 30 minutes each way or something like this. What could be happening is that when the behavior is abstract, you might be more aware of it. Whereas when the behavior is concrete, it doesn't separate you and the game. So it's just part of the experience. So like in VR, Jared, maybe, maybe what's going on is that because I'm embodied and because I'm in the experience, I'm not considering the same issues or problems because that's just part of gaining it. Uh, Jeremy talked about planned motion over spontaneous motion. Maybe it's like, it, this is the experience, right? So I'm not critiquing it. If you play sports, for example, you're often not thinking about, you know, how much effort you're exerting during the event. You think about it afterwards, right? When it's all been expended. Um, with like the we, you know, people are like, yeah, I don't want to move because I'm doing, you know, there's several because I'm moving stuff and I'm holding my hand pointing at it instead of uh -huh. resting in the lap. And more, I'd say more people are aware. I think with like immersive technologies, it that's the key, I think. So what Sam said to kind of follow into that nice, nice job there. You've all you even figured out you don't have to move that much. How many of you play Wii bowling and just flick your wrist and get a perfect game? You figure out pretty quickly you don't got to get off your couch and jump around like an idiot. No, Just Dance is the best example where you can just shake the remote and get points. Yeah, you just do this and you win, right? Yep. So part of it could be that the, the mental comparison you're making is still gaming, whereas in the VR component, you're right. It probably is much more physically exerting, but you may not be aware of that because for you, that was part and parcel of the experience. It's actually something we're hoping to test relatively soon by giving people accelerometers and measuring their actual movements and then giving them the demand scale. And one of the predictions we have is that in virtual reality systems, you might have more movements, but lower perceptions of demand because the movement was considered part of the experience, if that makes any sense. Uh, Alex Sackis asked about flow states and uh, flow states are a tricky one. We study them a lot at tech, by the way, and it's the idea that the challenges offered by the system and your skill to match them are so well tied together that you kind of lose awareness and you're so focused on the event that you don't consider time. I bet Jared and Sam, you don't consider energy either that yeah. you just flow right on through it. And it's only mm -hmm. after the fact where you're like, wow, it's 3 a.m. My legs are sore. <laughs> you know, absolutely could play a role in this. So it's a good question. It's actually something that we don't have a great answer for. It could be a good research project. You know, the, yeah, the difference between perception. What? We, we were talking about having a study, to, like looking at the haptics and see how people perceive it. And it's the same kind of process where because it's a VR, then I'm probably going to be accepting more that this game has a some sort of responsive thing rather than just playing a Wii. Possibly. Yeah, the idea is if it's part of the system, I may not think about it as much. I may not critique it as much, you know. Um, even though remember, perceptions aren't always accurate, it doesn't make them wrong. Perceptions are really important to how we design the experiences. Uh, for example, in games, it's not as if games actually do let you do whatever you want, but a good game gives you the perception you can do whatever you want, but actually has a pretty strict rule system in place. Uh, Jeremy talked about getting disoriented in VR. Uh, um, you know, leaning on objects that don't exist, um, thinking about how we, what well, in fact, Jeremy, I think this is a really good example of, um, you know, we get so mapped to what's happening in the virtual space 
that we actually forget that those objects don't really exist, right? And anybody who's used VR has done this before. You go to pick up something and it's not there, you know? Or you go and uh, punch your wall, punch the ceiling fan, and then you're in lots yeah. of pain. <laughs> yeah, when, when reality reminds you that it's there, you know? <laughs> Um, that absolutely can happen. 100% can happen there. Of course, you, you all have kind of already hit it, but beyond the mental models and learning the controller demands and how to actually make the controllers, there's the physical exertion aspect. Importantly, exertion isn't just a property of VR. You can exert yourself in controllers as well, right? And it doesn't have to be intense. Remember, all of these demands we're talking about are scales and they range from very, very, very low to very, very, very high. A big mistake a lot of folks make when they're studying research and variables is we think about things as being on versus off, yes versus no. It wouldn't be appropriate to say, does this game VR have emotional demand? Does it have cognitive demand? Well, yes, it has all of them. The question would be how much does it have, right? Um, and of course, there are different kinds of demands, you know, and this one's a pretty basic one, but it's gross body skills and fine motor skills and things of that nature. So I think we got most of that down pretty well. So what are physical demands? They're the extent to which a system requires the user to exert discrete or holistic demand uh, effort. You've got to put things into the system. And that's really important. Um, we are hoping to, man, we, Jared, we were so close. We have lost contact with our guy. Uh, we had a call, phone call with a guy in Virginia about the, it was the same omnidirectional treadmill that was used in Ready Player One. And I'm forgetting the name of it right now. Infinidec. Infinidec, thank you. Yeah, we had two conversations uh, with one of their directors and I'm wondering if COVID is throwing off some things because they, they kind of fell apart. So. I might try to revive that for Labor Day, follow up with them again. We were hoping to try to get an Infinidec on campus. Um, and then things kind of started falling apart. So the backup is the uh, Omnitrex, which is not great, but it's it's a backup and it's easier to get a hold of at least. I mean, if it happens within the next three years, I'll be happy. <laughs> it will definitely happen in the next three years. Um, I just don't know. And what Jared's talking about for folks who don't know is the omnidirectional treadmills. Mm -hmm where you can enter a digital space and you can do it in a way that you can move your body around and things correspond one to one, right? All right, with me so far, cognitive demands. Games make us think and process. The difference, by the way, of thinking and processing is that processing is what your brain's doing at a physiological level, which is a cognitive effect. And then there's sort of rationaling through and thinking through the puzzles, right? Emotional demands, that the games and VR elements have very many confusing and complicated and complex emotions. They don't all have to be that way. You can still just have fun and giggle, but the, the tapestry of emotions in games is not somehow limited because it's a video game. Physical demands, right, happen to give inputs into a system and have those inputs come back in a physical manner sometimes involving controllers, sometimes involving exertion, and oftentimes involving both, because in some ways in a VR system, you are the controller, or you can be the controller, right? And there's all sorts of gradations in between. And we can talk about social demands. So games tend to get talked about as a non-social medium. There's still kind of a presiding logic that games are something people do in isolation. And it's a weird one, because if you look at the history of games, they started off social. So the very first game over here, anybody recognize this one? This was a game called Space War, and it was played at MIT. And it was developed by a group of computer, sci uh, computer engineers they weren't really, who were just trying to figure out how to push the limits of their technology. And they developed this program that could take user input, compute that input, present it into a graphical interface, and it allowed two people to control spaceships, the needle and the wedge, flying around a gravity well and trying to shoot each other. Well, how come there wasn't a computer-controlled opponent? There wasn't enough computing power. Like, we don't have that yet. We got two people sitting next to each other. 
What's unique about this Pac-Man machine? Uh, it's multiplayer. It's got two players. And why is it set like a table? Against each other. And um, why uh, why a table and not just like two chairs like in front of a cabinet? So you could see the other player right in front of you as things happen. See the player yeah. in front of you. Where were these machines usually put? Arcades. Before arcades. It's Sorry. 1970s. Go ahead, Lindsay. Diners. Diners and bars. It's 1970s. Arcades don't exist yet. And you're going to develop a game. You want people to play each other. They put them next to the dartboards in the pool halls. Right? Um, very social. And these tables often had like drink holders and cigarette holders. It's a social event. And of course, what's extra social about arcade machines? They almost all have one thing in common. that makes them surprisingly high score high score why is the high score add a social element to all this because you want to be the you best some, you yeah you want to be the best you tag your name to it right and of course down here are probably the earliest examples of esports the uh, arcade world championships in the early 80s these are broadcast by abc's Y world of sports Oh, Sam was talking online about the virtual funerals, and we should definitely bring that up a little later because we're seeing a lot of that. Uh, well, I guess it does fit into social, doesn't it? People co-opt these social spaces. Um, you know, what, what's missing from this screen? So I have a console, and why do I have a console? What's unique about this one? Couch co-op. Couch co-op. And in fact, it's almost impossible to find a console that doesn't allow for multiple controllers. So. What's so special about the Wii modes, the Wii logo? Uh, the eyes look like people. And that was intentional. The eyes are meant to look like two people playing next to each other. There's a very long and rich history of games being social spaces. Um, what's missing from this screen, speaking of sociality? These are all kind of old. Online, much, yeah. I, guess. I don't have any of the online yeah. play. You know, you you log into World of Warcraft. Anybody ever been in anybody ever been in Azeroth or like been in a major city in World of Warcraft on a busy day? Alex, how Alexander, how many people are you seeing in there? Um, a long time ago, it could be upwards of like a thousand yeah. or three thousand people. Nowadays, they run this thing where you can only see a set number of people, right? So your game doesn't break. But right. it used to go to like thousands of people. And that's pretty amazing, right? Like you're running around this crowded city and there's thousands of real people. Uh, Sam Couch just shared a story of people going into these environments and having funerals and having weddings and like having social events that sometimes aren't even about the game. They're about real life, but they're using the game as a social space, right? Then you've got products like Fortnite, where just 100 random people dive in at one time, right? Um, I've been playing Tetris 99, like there's no tomorrow. I cannot stop playing this game. Sam, go ahead. You had your hand up. Um, I was noticing that there was a thing on Fortnite, I saw it yesterday, that they added a panther uh, statue or thing, and it was after the... Oh, His name oh. escapes me. The the actor who plays Black that Panther. Chadwick Boseman passed away. That guy, when he, yeah. uh, they were saying that, oh, this was already planned. But I'm like, that seems awfully convenient that you oh, just yeah. so happened to implement this right after he died. I'm like, that seems awfully convenient to just have happened. <laughs> it did seem like a weird excuse for just like we're celebrating somebody. You could just say that too. <laughs> like, I, I don't know why they didn't yeah. just openly no. say, yes, this is a memorial. But these are all examples of spaces that are incredibly social that sociality plays a key role um there's social vr now or the next vr big chat wave, vr chat yeah the next big wave in vr is breaking the boundary to where it's not just you and the machine but it's you and the machine and the machine and somebody else's and then you're all talking together and that's kind of considered the holy grail of VR right now. Like, can we have interactions in a digital space? Oh, go ahead, Jerry. I can actually throw my third question. Yeah, please. In. Um, it's what's the 
and what's the effect on so on the social demands of the player in regards to immersive media? Uh, VR chat as, a, in a, as an example, at, which is compatible with not just VR users but also pancake users or you know just PC. Uh, and then there, another, another part of it is how does it affect you know ex extroverts versus introverts? Um, and what about the connections to your to your avatar? And when you are the avatar compared to in other games, and then presence and presence and its role in a lot of that. I know it's like eight different questions. <laughs> it's like five. Well, it's funny. Many of your questions, I mean, they're actual. Th those are research questions. Like we don't know because the stuff is so new that we just we just don't know. But what I so find, I'm I'm, I want to say, <laughs> I want to slice out one part of Jared's question and throw it out to the group. Would it matter? If we're all in a VR chat, we all have our own character and we're talking to each other in a digital world, in, a, in an online digital space. Some of us are fully immersed. And I want to give a definition of immersion. This actually comes up in a discussion for one of our other Saturdays. But when I say immersion, I'm referring to a feature of the technology called sensory immersion. And it's that the technology taps the human senses, hearing, touch, sight, those things, right? And the results of that are this feeling of presence, that you feel like you're in a virtual world. Would people wearing VR gear feel a different level of social presence than people not wearing VR gear? Or could it be the case that they're just dealing with different demands? I would think of different demands. What's one difference that's probably really obvious? Being able to reach out and do touch that, like grab things. So how will we call that based on today's conversation? Oh, like the physical, physical. exertion. Yeah. Man. So you, you could see an argument to where perhaps it's the case that people wearing the equipment might have to feel different physical demands, which could augment the experience and make it feel more social. It could also disrupt the experience because you're dealing with more stuff, right? Uh, um, a couple of folks said, "No, it doesn't seem to balance. It doesn't seem to affect my social connection um, in VR chat." Of course, that could be because VR chat doesn't really require you to do very much, does it? You're yeah. just talking at the end of the day. Um, some folks argue it becomes more personal. I think it's an open question. I think I could fit one of my questions Please in here. Please do, yeah. Um, so I'm sure some of y'all saw uh, a few months ago that uh, this woman uh, interacted with her dead daughter in VR in uh, South Korea. Is everybody and, familiar with this one? Yeah, I see. I frequently this hand. You're like, yes, yeah, yeah, I see this one. All right, go ahead. I think it was last year. Was it uh, last year ago? Yeah. But yeah, yeah it was I recent. forget when. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's two years ago. Go ahead, Riley. Yeah. Um, but I guess the way it kind of fits here, uh, going like a little bit different than what my question actually is, is like, would that experience be different? Like if it wasn't in VR, if she was just sitting with like a game pad looking at a screen, right? Or is it like more immersive because she is in VR? And there's well, like and so just to be clear on the immersive part, I'm going to continue to argue that immersion is a feature of technology. So by definition, it was more immersive because you literally had more senses. But I think what you're talking about is social demand. Right. Yeah. Okay. Like what would make that experience more socially demanding than just seeing it on a flat screen? What would the differences be? Or is it a combination of demands? Remember, these demands are separate, but they probably correlate with each other. Right. So I actually had a pump question that was basically about this, if I can ask it. Uh, what, let's do, but let's tie it into Riley so that we can answer both of them. Cool, go ahead. What do we think about Riley's question? I, I want to go to Alex, but I want to make sure we answer it first. I don't want to get confused. So he's asking about like what would make this experience different from a demand perspective. If you're in VR, sitting with your dead daughter, as opposed to like looking at a video of your dead daughter or just interacting with her on a screen, what would the demand profiles look like? 
Well, cognitively, it might differ a little bit. Might you use different cognitive abilities to process VR versus flat? You might. So there could be a reason that the cognitive demands are, you're not solving anything, but you're activating different regions of your brain. That could be one idea. Emotionally, is there a reason to believe that one could be different than the other? What do we think? I feel like it would be emotionally more, like more intense. Maybe it's the same emotions, but they could be magnified. Yeah. You know, possibly. Uh, um, someone thought about physical presence, which could, you know, I think the physical dimension is the most obvious one, right? One is much higher than the other because uh, it's requiring more of you. Now, some folks have suggested that socially it may not be any more demanding. What do we think? Would it be, is it possible that it's more or is it a different kind of social demand? Well, maybe like, I don't know how, this, how the exact program works, but like um, you might use hand gestures, if it, like if that were a thing. Possibly, yeah. You might be more inclined to like respond to the person like they're a human, if they're humanly sitting in front of you. Uh, there's some research on what's called the social facilitation effect, that in the presence of other people, we tend to behave a little differently uh, because we're, we're triggered into their sociality. It's probably a really good empirical question to ask. Like it'd be an interesting research project to find out like, is the demand profile of a VR event different than a flat event? And does it matter for particular outcome variables? But I guess the, you know, the point, the fact that we don't have an answer doesn't mean we're doing it wrong. I think it points to the potential for what we could be studying in the future. And we can be asking ourselves like, you know, because for example, what if the woman who did it had no prior VR experience? Could that disrupt the experience? It would be more cognitively demanding. It could, and it may be too much, right? And so I think about the VR folks on the call, one of the big barriers is the stuff isn't always that easy. Sometimes the controls don't work properly. Or you have to learn them, that they're not natural at all. And so someone hops in there and after five minutes, they're like, now I'm dizzy and confused and I don't care. I would have tried this thing, but I'm done with it now, right? I just want the controller in my hand. And so who knows, maybe the controller lowers all the other demands and puts all the focus on the social demands, which might actually be better. So these are interesting questions we can ask ourselves, right? Um, someone's talking about a, a game where you heal yourself by putting a needle in your arm and it's just like, it's a bit too much. Although save that one for our conversation on presence. Um, that one's going to play a big role. Um, Avery talked about it being higher in every way. It could be, but that might be a problem. And we'll talk in a couple slides about why that might be a problem, uh, why it may not actually be a good thing. Okay. Social demand obviously can be something as simple as playing together. This is the couch co-op. This is me playing Double Dragon because the game is... Uh, almost 30 years old now. Um, so I'm coming to grips with that. Um, there's also the idea of playing socially, even if only one person is playing. And that's pretty common too. You know, uh, we call it tandem play, where one person's driving the experience, but then everybody else is kind of jumping in and playing along. So like way back when we would draw Zelda maps, like one person would be playing Zelda, but the like, other person would be drawing the map on the side and we compare notes because we all threw the Nintendo box away that came with the map. Because, you know, we were heathens and didn't respect the sanctity of video game content. There's playing on Twitch, which is a whole new level of social demand. What mm -hmm. makes Twitch different than Couch Co Play? It's a lot more people. A lot more people, it could mm -hmm. be, right? We do a lot of research on, we've actually been doing studies in our lab about playing Twitch but then you're playing in front of a thousand people instead of 10 people, instead of one person. And do you know them very well? No. Oh, no, I got you. Yeah. What's that? Uh, I've actually befriended some gamers. You can know them, of course, but I mean, yeah, usually. We got, we got friends with them. Yeah. I, and you can get to know over time, which is another interesting thing. You suddenly make a thousand friends after playing Twitch for a while. These can be very social spaces. Um, I've played with a Twitch streamer, so what's that? that was an interest. I've played with a Twitch streamer, so oh, yeah. that was an interesting experience. Just kind of being like I was part of it with him, but then I would switch over and look, and it's just like all these people are talking. I'm like, I know none of you. I just know this yeah. guy, 
And then I just go back to basically only talking with him, but I was aware that there were a, a bunch of other people that could hear and probably see my character. And that's exactly. kind of a new experience, right? This is this <laughs> idea that suddenly I'm exhibiting gameplay. So in some ways, it's not that different than the arcade in the 80s. It's just the arcade's a lot bigger. And people can dump it at any time. Because, I mean, I remember playing games as a kid and playing Captain America and the Avengers and some little snot-nosed jerk looking over my shoulder and critiquing my gameplay while I'm, like, eating a Twizzler in one hand and trying to play the game in the other. This is not new. Um, but it's just larger. And it can cross any number of boundaries. We also see a lot of social problems pop up as a result, you know, because people have used these spaces for hate. And there's a whole other dimension of games that we didn't think would be a thing, right? Then there's connecting with non humans. There's the idea that you could chat or form social relationships with avatars that don't have any human driver behind them. On the screen right now, you're seeing my avatar in, in Warcraft. All that, these are old photos. Um, I've played a little more since then. This is when Mr. Pandaria launched. This was my, my, my Pandarian warrior. And um, when we interview gamers and we ask them about their avatar and how they connect to it, sometimes it's this object orientation. Well, the, the avatar is really just a set of pixels to do things on screen. There's no social relationship. I don't feel close to this character. I don't really see it as a separate thing. It's just a thing on screen. That's all it is. Then there's me, where the, the character is basically a representation of me, right? It's my version of me online. Maybe it's idealized, maybe it's not. So I have this weird thing where I play sports games. That's not weird. What's weird though, is I make my player 38 years old, five foot eight and 195 pounds. You know what sport that body shape's good for? None. None, none sports. That's exactly right. It's fucking terrible for every sport. Guess what happens as a result? Your avatar sucks. I'm usually not very good. Like I just got called up from the Toledo Mud Hens in MLB The Show like two weeks ago. So think about this in my private life. I simulate being a middling, you know, semi-old, like hanging on to last years of his life professional baseball player. That's a little weird. Like I bat like 210 and I sometimes start and sometimes ride the bench and it's still fun, right? Now I have another version of me that same body shape, but I made two changes. One, he's only 18 years old. In two, I put all the settings in beginner. Folks, I am batting 673 for the season. Six, the announcers, you know how you win awards in sports games? They don't even know what to say because these numbers are so really good. He's batting over 350. I'm like, you sure is. <laughs> I sure am. Like, so they give these stats out that are so, like, they didn't imagine that somebody would play the game and bat like 673 with 87 home runs, 112 stolen bases, and 98 triples. You know, I'm pretty good. I, I should try out sometime. Then there's the other relationship where your avatar on screen is a totally separate person from you. It, it's its own agent. It's got its own needs, its own desires. It does its own thing. And then you've got something in the middle called a symbiote. And these are people who are like kind of playing as themselves, but also kind of borrowing from the other avatar's experience. Well, what's interesting about this typology is that it suggests that just because the avatar is in front of you doesn't mean that's you. Um, I think object makes the most amount of sense. Most of us are like, oh yeah, I play video games and I can like, you know, I move things around on the screen, but I don't care. Um, Alexander talked about how the protagonist from Fallout 4 is a symbiote, and we could talk about that. But one of the things I'm gonna argue is, I don't know if the game is what determines what these relationships are. It's In many you. ways, it's the player. Yeah. Um, and one of the arguments here, is that you're the one putting a lot of um, 
uh, of perception into these different characters. Oops, sorry, I'm covering them up. So like over here, for those of you who have met me in person, uh, that's not me. You know, I picked the warrior because I can carry around a massive, I carry around a hammer. I just hit things all day. That's all I do. What do you um, mean? It looks exactly like you. Yeah, it's just he has a You're wearing a white shirt. You have a black undershirt. Maybe he it's not too far off after all. Black shirt. <laughs> Up top here is a character where I just walk around in a fishing hat and I play Warcraft and all I do is go fishing. And there have been times where I've been spawned to an instance and I still have my fishing rod equipped and I don't realize it. And so I go attack things and I'm hitting them with this jeweled rod. Um, the character over here is Dr. Banks. And that's her character. And this was, uh, we used to have a cat and a dog. So I had a cat uh, pet, she had a dog pet. We used to fight them all the time. That was kind of fun. Um, we were not really playing the game. And can you see what's in the background for Warcraft players? This was the uh, the festival that goes on like once a month. We can go play carnival games, and you can like, you ever play this before? You like carnival games and races, and you can eat foods. It's basically a dark moon fair. This was literally a date, right? Were these object players? What do you think? Yes or no? Definitely not. These weren't just pixels on screen for us. For us, this was Dr. Banks lives in Toronto. I live in West Virginia. We want to have a date night, but we don't want to drive six hours. So let's go visit the fair in Warcraft. Right? These were probably me players. I mean, we literally, here's my cat. Here's her dog. They don't look like us, but all of our behaviors in the game were like, literally it was her and I talking about the week. So like our chat was like, hey man, how did class go this week? But I don't believe any one of these characters is like a college professor in Warcraft. We just use the experience as a social space for our own behaviors. Um, a couple of you talked about symbiotes. I wanna hear more from you on this. Like that some of your avatars, you see them as symbiotes where it's like part of you and part of them. What do you mean by that? So, it, oh, you go ahead. Would it be like that? Like um, when you play a game that has like a clear cut protagonist, you play as the protagonist. Like I just played Ghost of Tsushima, and the main character, his name is Jin. And like sometimes I'd be telling my friends, like, I did this. And then other times I would be saying, Jin did this. So, is that like symbiotic? So, it could be, or it could be code switching. Or maybe there are some times where it's you because you want to own the behavior, and sometimes it's it's them because they did the behavior. So we know from sports psychology. Has anybody ever here on the call ever heard of berging and corping? So berging is basking in reflective glory. Um, when things happen that we like, so like when our sports team wins, I won, we won. And corping is cutting off reflective failure. So when a team went, loses, who loses? They lost. They lost. We win, they lose. So mm -hmm. we won the Stanley Cup, but the Blues lost in the playoffs. Right? That could be what's going on, Riley. And in fact, some people argue that um, it's not always the case that we have won, that it could be <laughs> context dependent or game dependent. We could bounce back and forth between them. Um, some games, like Jared pointed out, do kind of encourage you to use you language where they want it to be you in the game. But then sometimes we adopt characteristics of the character as well. Have you ever played a game before and like you had one of these moral choices to make and then you think about what you would do, but then you think about what your character would do? That was, yeah, I have done that before a lot. Sure. I was like, wait, what should I do? Yeah, what would I do? But what would what would I do? But do? I know for a fact this character would do something completely different. Avery mentioned that's basically Dungeons and Dragons, right? And that's one of the things about role play. Um, and in early games, role play was really more of like your link. Go stab things until you win. But more modern experiences are your link. Here's this complex moral world. Go figure it out. Good luck. Good luck. Um, yes, or you? Will we not? I don't know. You go find out. Alex mentioned about like the in Fallout 4, the protagonist has its, his own desires to find your son. You can do whatever the hell you want. 
right? Some players will play it straight. They'll go find the sun. And some players will do whatever they want to do. Red Dead Redemption 2. I know my character has a narrative backstory. I don't know what it is because I don't pay attention. Whenever he starts talking, I'm like, blah, 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 blah. Shut up, shut up, shut up. Get me back to my horse. I've got chickens to save. And I just wait in town in the bar until someone comes into town with a gun. And then I go rope them. And then I throw them off a ledge. <laughs> I love doing this. I, I could not, I've probably logged hundreds of hours in Red Dead Redemption 2. I could not tell you the story. <laughs> I have no clue. The story is I got a horse. <laughs> That's what I have. And I shoot things. And I have not left. So there's one thing that happened where I found a woman who had like disappeared. And that's pretty much it. Um, I just like getting in gunfights. Um, well, this kind of um, this kind of relationship happens like um, in Telltale games. Like the whole point of a Telltale game is like you make the choices of what the char main character says, and also very big important decisions that determine the outcome of the story later on. Sure, sure. And this part's fun because going back to that, it's an unfinished text all of them are relevant and legitimate ways of playing, right? But you can see how your relationship with your avatar could actually be social. Like the me category, probably not social. That's just me. It's an extension of me. I might have social relations with other people, but me and my avatar are the same thing. If I'm playing a video game as an object player, do I really have social relationships in that game? Nope. Probably not. I probably don't care. Anybody ever play StarCraft before? Or, um, oh gosh, what's the EVE, EVE Online? E EVE is a spaceship war game. It's not really about forming relationships, right? When I play chess, I don't bond with my characters. What do I do with my pawns? Sacrifice. I sacrifice them. I don't know their names. I don't know their backstories. I don't know their histories, but I do know they're in the way of my more powerful characters. So please get out of the way. Maybe get in the way of the queen if you got time. Otherwise, get out. But they can be some of the most useful things because you get more powerful things. They certainly can be, which is the whole game of chess, right? It's all strategic, but there's virtually no narrative and no social interaction with the characters, right? And Sam makes a point if you're really good, you know. Uh, Matt talks about how um, Eve is about forming relationships, but what it's really about is forming relationships and then violating, betraying people, destroying their stuff, stealing their money. He's not wrong if you played Eve. It's a cutthroat game, you know. It is very much survival of the wicked and the fittest, right? These things all help us better understand players as they're in these experiences and what the demands may or may not be. I'm probably not that concerned about the war, about the Mortal Kombat player who is always killing people but has an object orientation towards their character. Because they're probably not interpreting death as death. What are they probably interpreting it as? A win. A win. A win or a loss. It's a very different way they're interpreting the content. So for them, it's not at all morally questionable to rip somebody's spine out. It's the win state. But if you were playing that Call of Duty game and you were used to be, and let's say you were investing as yourself in the protagonist and all of a sudden they hand you a weapon and go shoot a bunch of civilians and you do it, suddenly guilt reactions kick in. Because you're like, oh my gosh, I just yeah. killed a bunch of civilians. What's that? Yeah, that's where it kind of becomes morally ambiguous. Right, you're like, mm, I didn't wait a minute. do that. Right. Um, there was a lot of stories in Warcraft about a torture scenario. <laughs> Dylan, it's not morally questionable to rip someone's <laughs> spine out. Someone's spine. Well, that's on recording. I hate this fall, man. Everything gets recorded. <laughs> like I told all my students how to pirate movies. <laughs> oh, of course, you already knew that, so that's okay. All right, cool. What are social games. demands? Social demands are the extent to which a system triggers an implicit or explicit response to the presence of other people. And the key there is other people can be people. They can also be avatars. That's a lot of stuff. It's been a long day. And I appreciate y'all hanging in here. We're almost to the end. Mm -hmm. This is what I'm trying to get at, though. Even something as simple as games. These demands play a critical role in how we process what's going on on screen. 
um, Alexander talked about, you know, I wouldn't feel guilty if someone was going to kill me. That's one of the things you play with in games, right? Just like I boxed in high school. So I didn't feel bad when I punched somebody. If anything, I, I felt quite good about it, right? This map here tries to lay out what we think is a simple model for how video game characteristics might impact different types of demands and then how those demands might in turn impact whether or not or how we enjoy and appreciate things. We don't have the answers. This is all relatively new work. Where we think this model might be useful is helping us tease apart the link between here and here. That maybe what's going on is it's not as simple as just some games have things that are fun. Koji, can you explain the difference between enjoyment and appreciation to folks? Yeah, so um, for a long time, when we were considering the effects of media, we were looking at it from like a purely um, hedonic, pleasure-driven um, approach where um, people watch things or people play games because they want to feel pleasurable outcomes. Um, but that sort of approach didn't explain a lot of observed phenomena um, as far as media effects goes, where we couldn't really explain why people would um, be drawn to um, experiences that make them feel fear or make them feel sadness or any uh, um, or different emotions or um, uh, different outcome states. And so um, this idea of um, appreciation or um, uh, is based on an older, a much older idea um, from the ancient philosophers of uh, eudaimonia. And appreciation refers to meaningfulness. It refers to connection. Um, and so that's a different kind of outcome than we get with something that is purely giving us a pleasurable outcome as well. Yeah, so basically entertainment became the umbrella term to capture these reactions that were pleasurable and like arousing hedonic. Thank you for that. And appreciation became a term to capture people's deeper responses. And we think they're both really important to how we go about understanding media reactions. By the way, when I move the video back and forth, do you see everybody's faces like on the screen and then off the screen? No. Oh, so you're I'm only seeing the slides, huh? I'm doing it through a browser. I only see your face up in the top corner. You've never, you haven't been seeing the slides the whole time? Well, I've seen the slides, but. Okay, but I, you're not seeing it. I don't see everyone's face. I just see you. Or yeah, whoever's talking. Yeah, okay. we can make it like where there's multiple faces, but it doesn't show everybody. It just shows. No, no that's okay. It recently. was more on my end for the recording. I was trying to get them all on there, and it looks like it may not have uh, popped up that way. So I'll mm. uh, I'll get it figured out later. Um, but you are seeing the slides, right? Yeah. yeah. You're yes. just not seeing when I move. Like right now, you don't see a bunch of faces. Not at all. No. Okay. And this is the slide. I have like six people's faces. Cool. Yeah. No, Roger, you see six faces. Okay, no worries. I didn't see whoever's talking. Cool, gotcha, no worries. All right. Um, so, can we think of where some of these demands might explain some entertainment reactions and not other entertainment reactions? So what about cognitive demands? Which ones do we think that might be more related to? As in choosing between enjoyment and appreciation? Yeah. Uh, I would say appreciation personally because cognitive is how much you think about it. But think so about what? The game itself and how things interchange and work together. I'm, I'm going to have to argue with that. I'm going with enjoyment on actually because i do notice that it goes to both but i personally think it's more enjoyment because the games i play have puzzles and i enjoy puzzles and so i like thinking through the puzzles and trying to figure them out so you so think more personal towards, examples is good and you're kind of on the right track when we go back to cognitive demand the definition 
seems to be more about understanding the game itself. Not necessarily the narratives, not necessarily the, um, you know, the, the context, but literally like the model of how to play the game, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's probably more related to, you know, enjoying it. What about emotional demand? Oh, I was... Again, okay. all of them probably somewhat affect all of them, but some are going to be stronger than the others. And our data suggests that cognitive demand is usually about enjoyment. Um, the game was puzzling, you know, the game was challenging, the game twisted my brain, the game made me think. Um, it tends to be associated with like, I solved these puzzles, I figured this out. Yes. Um, what about emotional demand though? I would say emotional demand is more appreciation because uh, uh, when a game is like emotionally taxing, I guess, kind of like Ghost of Tsushima, I cried so much playing that game. And it's like, did I enjoy that? Or do I just appreciate that the game was able to like invoke those like strong feelings in me? So right. I would say I appreciate it. So some people would argue, just like you said, that um, the emotional actions tend to be associated with really laboring through what's happening to you and your characters and their vessel. Um, and we see more likely than not in our data that emotional demands tend to be more strongly correlated with appreciation, right? Uh, with this, okay, I got this, I got this figured out. Um, or I have in that deeper emotional reaction. Um, the pensive reactions, things like that. And in fact, we see somewhat that cognitive and emotional demands can conflict at times. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, what about the physical demands of exertion and control? Which ones do you think those are more associated with? Enjoyment, personally. Probably enjoyment. Um, why? Because the more you put in, the more you get out. Uh, I go a little deeper than that, and it's a little bit more on they're focused on the gameplay again. You know, they're usually more focused on performance, you know, winning, losing, solving puzzles. In fact, cognitive and physical are pretty heavily tied to each other because your ability to physically control the game changes your ability to make sense of the game, right? And what about social? What do you all think? I'd say it could lean towards both, really, because how how it's executed, I would say, is more important because you could enjoy the social, enjoy being with friends, but you know everything's more fun with friends, like in my opinion. But keep in mind that all of them can connect to all of them, but we're trying to go a little deeper into like what are these things conceptually measuring and then as a result why would we expect there to be a stronger connection for one than the other oh then probably lean more towards enjoyment just because you know everything's more fun with friends and mm -hmm. you know when you and that not even if you're playing something a single player game and you interact with avatars and stuff and there's a little something more social there the systems in game, you know, it, it makes it come alive and makes it more more fun, basically. Okay, what else we got? So the trick question is that this is all stuff we're still studying. So like our lab group is still working on these things. And some of the data that we do have, we're finding that Physical and cognitive demands tend to be much more associated with enjoyment. Whereas emotional and social demands seem to be more heavily tied to appreciation. And the argument is that the cognitive and the physical bits seem to be more ludic in nature. They're more about the gameplay. Whereas the emotional and social bits seem to be more about the context of the play, the narratives, the stories, the conversations. So, we tend to see correlations of all of them, but those tend to be the stronger ones. Um, it might depend on the game, it might depend on the player. There's a lot of work that needs to be done here still. Um, but one of the implications of this is that what happens if you have a game 
that tries to pull you in cognitive and emotional directions, those things can sometimes conflict because you're trying to solve the puzzle and then care deeply about it. Or the experience where you push F to press to pay respects, right? One of the digs on that is it's kind of silly. Like I'm in this deep somber moment, but I have to break that model completely to push a keyboard button, right? These are really good things to think about. Well, what Avery talked about the genre, we're not finding that it matters as much because we're also finding that genres don't seem to matter as much anymore. Um, so like what genre is Grand Theft Auto? Third person shooter, action. You can play in first person too also. Mm -hmm. It's also an RPG. Everybody does that. Yeah. You know, but it's also an RPG. It has a first person angle. It's got a flight simulator. It's got a driving simulator. You can play with other people. Yeah, you can be very social in nature. It could be an NMO, right? We're seeing that um, most, you know, open world action RPG might work, but then now it's four genres, mm -hmm. right? What we're starting to see in game development is that the um, genre classification is really, really good when you were explaining Ludic. When I say Ludic, does everybody know what I'm talking about? Uh, Ludic refers to gameplay, the play in general, the rules of play. Genres meant a lot when games can be distinguished by their gameplay dimensions. But as the technology advances, as the narratives advance, and as our systems advance, we collapse across genres now. Um, to where genre doesn't mean as much as it used to, because it's not necessarily what's on content, what's on screen. Right? We could argue all day about it. That's kind of the point, though. You shouldn't have to. Right? Genre is supposed to be a classification system. It's not a very good classification system if things can fit in 15 different categories or 35 different categories, right? Um, that conversation comes into here because I often get the question, well, wouldn't the genre predict what demands are more important? And the answer is you would think so, except the genres aren't clear anymore. And if we go with like the unfinished text argument, we can kind of play however we want to. Um, Red Dead Redemption wasn't meant to be Horse Simulator 2. But for one idiot, it is. And so the demands of that game are very different. Like, you know, mine are like weirdly emotional and social. I want to like save people and I want to make sure they're okay. By the way, those characters in the background you can save, do they have any backstory at all? Some of them. Very few of them though. Most of them run away and you never see them again. They don't have a name. It's bit by a snake. I, he's been bitten by a snake like yeah, that. Yeah, I have no idea. I could give him one, right? But he doesn't have one. Um, but yet I'm adding like social dimensions to that player. Why am I doing that? For me, it's my stress release. I just found a game that works for one particular purpose and I dial down on that purpose, right? Science and studying games and studying players is not so deterministic. It, it, and, and it's not opinion driven. A lot of it, and the whole point of today's talk is the players shape a lot of this. Remember when I said interactivity is product or interactivity is process? Once you shift to interactivity as process, you can't just say it's X. It just doesn't work that way. And so one of the things you might study is how these characteristics are perceived by the players on these different demands which might predict and explain why some people might get one reaction and then other people might play the same game and get a different reaction. And perhaps understanding these perceptions of demand will help us unlock that puzzle, which is something that a lot of developers are trying to understand now. We're realizing the limits of what you can program in. And now we're thinking about, well, rather than worrying about how much we can determine out of the player's actions and experiences, how much can we let them figure it out for themselves a little bit? Going away from programming it and getting into the experience itself. Okay? So for the last bit of our call, we're going to show you some different studies that have been done. Okay. And then um, we'll, and we'll, we'll pull it out from there. Okay. Any questions about that approach? Or about what these demands are or why they might be relevant? Could there be other demands possible? These come from, and I know Alex Sackis is on the call, uh, she has a psychology background. 
these come somewhat from a model of psychology that talks about, um, you know, that when we talk about trying to understand people, we can often talk about their, their cognitions, their thoughts. We can talk about their feelings. And we can talk about their behaviors. And then we add in a social element here, and that's more the contribution of communication scholarship. And we can also talk about how people bond and interact with each other, including non-human, you know, objects. And we think that this, remember, interactivity is process, is how it's being perceived by the end user. We might be able to use these processes to better understand the relationship between how things are programmed and finally the entertainment outcomes that we're going for. Both intended entertainment outcomes, but also the unintended outcomes, right? And that's something that we're often talking about when we study media. Any questions about that? Riley, go ahead. Um, could you expand a little bit on like the interactivity as product versus interactivity as process? Like, I don't feel like I totally understand the difference. So this here is interactivity as product. The interactivity is a feature of the technology. There are three buttons on here. That's it. I can only do so much with this thing in my hand. Many of you have played a game before where you wanted to do more, but you couldn't, right? I think it was Grand Theft Auto 3 didn't allow you to jump. So if you encountered like a moderately high wall, what was the result? You find a way around. You got to find a way around it. So you got an open world sandbox game where I can steal cars, shoot people, rob money, do all these things, but heaven forbid I encounter a wall that's knee high. If the wall's knee high, I got to walk all the way around it, right? That's or ramp a car. What's that? Or ramp a car over it. If you can, right? And then sometimes you try that and then other things would happen. So the interactivity is product are the objective features of the technology. How many buttons does it have? How many things can I do? They're programmed into the technology. It's a great question, Riley. It's the stuff that's programmed in. So I'm thinking of the VR folks on the call. You know, what can the device actually do? What can it not do, right? Not how well you're good at using it, but literally, what can it do, right? Um, kind of going on with that, I don't know if you've played the game Boneworks. It's kind of, it has a... It's a VR game. It's everything is is interactable. Like if you can see it, you go. And you, you, but you can't like put your hands through walls. Everything is physics object. And if you think you can do it, you probably can. Uh, you can you know climb up uh, things that are climbable, but also like large, tall, you know things that are up there. You can jump in game and you can put your hands up on it and pull yourself up. And that kind of made me think about it with the uh, Grand Theft Auto jumping over small led ledges, but with VR and specifically this game engine, you can do just about anything. Like you can also grab your gun and uh, hit enemies with it rather than shooting, and that'll that'll cause damage. And of course, there are some times where you can't, where you get into a VR simulator and you want to do something. And the game doesn't, the program doesn't let you do it. It's not programmed in, right? And it can be a very frustrating experience because you have this like illusion that you can do all these things, but in reality, you can't actually do them, right? So that would, those would all be examples of interactivity as product. What are the objective features of the technology? The device, the program, the game, the simulator, whatever it is, right? One of my favorite subreddits is game physics. And it's just people showing games with broken physics. Um, and it's an example of like what happens when the stuff goes off the rails. Interactivity is process, is your perception of the interactivity, how you make sense of it. So it's, like I said earlier, you know, this controller, some people can wave dash, some of us can't. It's not the controller's fault. The controller provides for it, but you have to actually have various experience and skill sets to actually pull it off. 
Um, think about it more abstractly. Um, you can think about times where, you know, we use a social media program and some people don't know there's a private channel. It's happened on Discord a lot, right? When people forget channels. Well, that's not the channel, that's not the program's fault. That's you, you know, not all of us know. Or how many of you are playing a video game and you suddenly discover you can do an extra move you didn't know about? And it fundamentally changes how you play the game. I remember when I was a kid and learned how to, um, uh, uh, um, oh, I forget the name of it, basically drift in Mario Kart. And like, once you learn that trick, oh, it's a whole different game. And in fact, in later versions of Mario Kart, drifting is now part of the skill set. But in the old 16 bit days, there was a version of drifting that involved basically hopping around corners, right? Mm -hmm. Those are all things that you're doing in the system. So all these demands on screen, they're not objective features of the technology. They're your perception of those features. Not every game is equally demanding for every person. Not every game is equally emotional for every person. Not every game is gonna have the same level of exertional control or controller. We're not all gonna have the same social relationships. Those are all variables that fall into the organism, their player perceptions. Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. And that's really important because in a lot of these debates, people will like confuse the object from the person. And this is something that we're seeing a lot in game development uh, is, a, is a better focus on the experience, on the user experience. But of course, by definition, look at this model. If you don't have the game characteristics, none of this matters. You have to have the characteristics to have all of these different experiences. And then these experiences and your perceptions of them probably drive these outcomes. So a good example is earlier when Sam said, well, I think cognitive demands are about enjoyment and here's why. Well, listen to what he was describing. Solving puzzles, making sense of environments. Those are all very much mental model type cognitive demands that are ludic in nature. Right, so that would make sense that that arc would fit for that type of product. Right? Now, is it the case that some games limit the variance in people's perceptions? Probably, and a good designer is shooting for that. We don't want it to just be everyone does whatever the hell they want, right? But there's this tricky connection that just because you program something or just because you offer a program doesn't mean people would use it. I know we have some folks on the call from the libraries, and I bet you get this a lot where you think that people are going to come in the library and they're going to use the VR headset in a particular way, and then they do like totally different things with it. And we're going, I don't understand. It's like, how are you doing this? How are you getting this wrong? Or how are you stumbling in this environment? And it's often, and I bet the folks on the call who have let their friends borrow equipment have seen this too, where you've got one particular view for this experience. And then their experience ends up being very, very different as a result. And you're trying to reconcile that. And some of it is how these, how these demands are perceived differently. And so sometimes I think the hope of today is if you understand the demands, you can start thinking about how you can nudge people towards the ones you want. You know, um, And that's where we're seeing developers who are taking up this model are trying to use it as kind of a, a predictive model. Oh, okay, I know players do X, so what if I made Allie a bad person? Would that increase emotional demands? It sounds like most of you are like, yeah, like it makes this game really complicated, and I have a bunch of different feels I wasn't expecting. And as Alex pointed out, Ooh. I know it's more than one Alex, sorry, that was kind of the point, right? They wanted you to feel different, conflicted, gray, ambiguous. Go ahead, Sam. Or it completely takes you out of the game and kind of it really could. messes up the experience. Hundred <laughs> percent. If it's done clumsily, right? If it's done it absolutely, that's where we think this model is interesting because it also might tell us where you don't want things to go. If you were trying to make a game that you wanted people to appreciate, you probably have to make it easy. If the cognitive challenges are too hard, people aren't going to be able to process the emotional content. A couple of you talked about hating quick time events in the chat. Why do folks hate quick time events? Because rarely do they actually reflect your skill that you have developed for the rest of the game. And it's mostly just push a button or else suffer a major consequence for something that you 
possibly couldn't even react to in time. So think about what you just said from this model. What do you think they're trying to do in terms of these demands for those quick time? Physical and cognitive. And they're trying say. to lower those, aren't they? They're trying to make that stuff super low so that you'll pay attention to the emotional bit. I mean, it's the same thing with the press app to pay respects. Exactly. They didn't want you to like have to like imagine if they made it hard to get to the coffin. <laughs> like there was like a platform of nails and then like a blinking object. Like it would kind of disrupt the flow. Of course, press F was somehow even more clumsy. <laughs> yeah, I think they could have just. Isn't that read. kind of a I've meme? It. It's definitely a meme. Oh, yeah. It is. Oh, yeah. I, 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 I was like, I, I get the feeling they did that because yeah. of the meme. I was just like, okay. Yeah, I know. Sure. 100%. That one is definitely a meme. But yeah, you know, it, it, that's where the meme came from. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh, exactly. I thought they and did that X because of the meme. Okay. I didn't know that came, that's where the meme came from. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So that's one example of where we can use this model and tease things out and try to get people to the right reaction. But it seems like it might be a little clumsy. Like I think for many of you, for the quick time players, you're like, yeah, but you took me, you took me so far out of enjoyment that it kind of broke the game for me. Like I was having a good time. And then it was, hey, super cool graphics, super big emotional event. Hey, all those skills you've been building up for 20 hours, now just sit back and hit the trigger button. When Metal Gear, when Metal Gear Rex shows up and you're like, what the hell? <laughs> like, no, I want to fight that thing, right? All right, so to kind of wrap into the research side of things as we get to the sort of the home stretch here, we do know that if you manipulate how much control the players have over the game in terms of physical demands, it actually influences how much intervention potential the game has to disrupt their moods. When I say intervention potential, I literally mean the content requires your focus so that you focus on the game and not other things. And so from a demand perspective, what's probably happening here, right, is that, well, what we're seeing is the game is requiring so much of your cognitive and physical attention that you're lowering your emotional reactions. How many of you have played games for mood management purposes? Like you're stressing out, so you play a game as a result. Yes. A yes. Lot of us do. And what kind I of games do you play it. when you want that to happen? What was the question? What kind of games do you tend to play when you just want to like stress release? Either <laughs> something relaxing or something I'm really good at. So something relaxing you're good at, Afrique, go ahead. You had something? I go for beat em ups. Beat em ups? I want to physically lay. I want to hit things and describe a beat em up. Is there a lot of co beat em ups? Don't have a whole lot of demand in terms of like, I got to solve this puzzle, right? Yeah. I'm yeah. Hit, yeah. hit buttons. Yeah. Exactly. I hear beat them. Simple as that. Yeah. What's the narrative? I don't know. That person's standing there and I'm standing here. I'm on the left side of the screen. They're on the right side of the screen. So I'm going to walk over to the right side of the screen. I'm going to punch things. I'm going to punch them. And punch them right and punch them. side people evil yeah right side people are the worst don't matter right it, it works um part of the reason it works is because you get a lot to focus on describe a beat-em-up lots of things coming at you and your job is to react to them and that's it you punch through them um it takes your attention away from your emotions you can't really think about what you're upset about because all of your attention is devoted towards punching these things both physical and cognitive and one of the results of that is if you were in a bad mood you probably aren't now you might actually forget what it was that was bothering you what if you picked the wrong game like sometimes i well, you could like fact, i play call of duty and i'll like if I'm anxious or stressed, sometimes like I get too into it and maybe I'm having a bad game or something and I'm just like, okay, this was like the wrong choice. Now so look at the chart on screen. Um, down below it talks, and I'm going to get to the age question in a moment. Um, the task demand condition, this was how much control people had over a flight simulator. Low meant they just had their hands on the controls, but the game was basically an autopilot. Medium meant that they had to... Um, fly and control the speed of the airplane, but everything else was done by the system. 
and high meant all the controls, all the speed, all the switches, like a full-on flight simulator. And these peaks here, higher scores meant better mood repair. So after playing this game, whatever bad mood you were in, you're not in it anymore. Your mood went up in terms of valence, in terms of positivity. It's not a straight line, is it? Nope. Why are the people in the, Riley answered the question, because why are the people in the high condition actually basically no better off than the people who did nothing? Because they're on the right side of the screen. Yeah, they're right side of the screen. They're evil. They're in a freak beat em up games and they need to get out of here. Riley, what's going on there? The demand was too high. Too high. So the right. trick about video games is that, yes, they are better at intervention potential, but games can also become their own source of stress. So you get this, what we call curvilinear relationship, where moderate levels are good, but if you get too much, you just replace one stressor with another stressor. That's not good, right? If you are playing for stress release, you know, um, playing Angry Birds at work and then losing the level. Like, that's the worst. You suck at your job. Go play video games or break. Ha, huh, you also suck at Angry Birds. You're just bad at this, <laughs> right? Uh, Jeremy Smith asked how age plays into this. I don't have an answer for that because we don't necessarily have a great understanding of how people's long-term engagement with this content plays a role. I think he was talking about the slide previous. Um, my suspe I suspect that it wouldn't so much be age as it would be experience with games, period. For example, when we go back to cognitive demands, we know that people who have a lar longer experience in history with games have developed those mental skills required to process 3D content better. So we did some research back at Michigan State when we found that the biological structures that help people rotate things in 3D actually differ between male and female biological brains. And it has to do evolutionarily with our roles of hunting and gathering and, and things of this nature. But when we studied females who played video games, the sex difference disappeared completely. And the argument was that your brain is a muscle and it's always working and rewiring itself based on the different connectomes that you're using. People with lots of video game experience are really good at that mental rotation test. I think the answer is pretty obvious, right? Because they've been using that skill for a long time. Many of you on the call might be familiar with research showing that like um, ep uh, um, orthopedic surgeons, these are surgeons who usually use technologies and robotics to do their surgeries. Gamers tend to be much better at orthopedic surgery. Because for a gamer, the idea of holding a controller and things happening over here, that's totally normal. Um, so it may not be age per se, but it would be their experience with the technologies. I bet you younger people don't have that golden hands rule as strong. Why not? Why would younger played people? Played as long. Go ahead, Sam. They haven't played as long. Like for me, I'm so used to the PS4 controller. It's probably going to be really hard for me to switch to a different console. Well, and more than just haven't played as long, game development is changing to where you may not assume that younger gamers have always used a controller. They use right. like their iPad or their phone. Right. And if you grew up gaming on iPad, gaming in VR, you may have a different idea of what a controller is. So it's a possibility. So like I can see, for example, for folks coming in, getting an assessment of what their experiences are, and it would help you understand why they're different. So probably not age per se, but it's probably tied into experience. Um, and experiences shape how you understand your demands later. One question we can ask about that, that VR study, and this is actually a study that Phil and I are designing right now. We're gonna replicate this study in VR to basically see if we'd see the same curvilinear effect, which one reason we would see that is that VR gives you even more to pay attention to, which could be a stressor, or it could be more natural because the stuff is all around you, and maybe it wouldn't be a stressor. Because maybe the stress in this game came from sitting at a keyboard and doing this all the time. But if you're in a cockpit and you're wearing a headset and everything's right in front of you, even though it actually takes more effort, 
it might seem more natural. So this is a study we're hoping to do in this. We are hoping to do it in the fall, but because of COVID, we moved it back to the spring. This is one of the examples. Um, to get to Jared's question about VR and emotion. So this is a study we did where we gave people a headset, had them watch news videos, documentaries in 360 degrees about flooding. And what we were hoping to see is that when people watch these flood stories, these disaster stories in 3D, they have stronger emotional reactions. Why would we expect that? They're more immersed. They're more immersed. They're, it's, maybe it's happening to them because they're standing there. Well, what we found is that they definitely felt more presence. This arrow should actually be green. In other words, the people who wore the headsets felt like they were standing in the high school. And people who just saw it on like a 360 YouTube, but on a computer on Pancake, they kind of felt presence, but not really. And then folks who just watched the regular YouTube video felt low levels of presence. You would expect that, wouldn't you? You're wearing a headset, it's in your eyes, it's in your ears, you're moving around. This was an, this was an Oculus Rift system, actually, we used it for this one. There was slightly more cognitive demand when you wore a headset or when you used a 360 video as compared to the flat screen. But the headsets were no more demanding than the videos. But the thing that killed us is emotional demands barely changed at all. There was no difference in emotional reaction between the flat screen, the 360 screen, or the immersive headset. What's going on there? You definitely felt more presence. You definitely felt more cognitive demand. You did not feel any difference in emotions. Which was the opposite of what we expected. Any ideas? Because they're still consuming the same content. So part of it is that it turns out simply changing the presentation may not actually change how people engage the content itself, which is a bit of a challenge because we expected there to be a big effect and yet not that emotional. So one could be, of course, that just the presentation quality doesn't override the fact that it's the same content. What do you got, Jared? Oh, did I unmute myself? Oops. Oh, sorry, no worries. What we think's going on is that feeling presence, which we'll talk about in a later conversation, doesn't necessarily make you feel closer to the story. There's a difference between being in an environment and being in a story. Uh, Jeremy Smith said there wasn't really any better emotional reaction. Just because you're in the video doesn't mean you were connecting with anybody. There wasn't any social demands in here either. So you were just standing around people, right? There, um, some folks talked about being dislocated from the environment. Um, although interestingly enough, what we found is that they actually did feel in the environment, no question. It's just that they didn't feel connected to the narrative itself. And what we realized in this study was that just because you're inside something doesn't mean you're connecting to it. I think a lot of early VR development just simply assumed, oh, well, if you're there, you'll care. I'm like, no. If you're there, you're there. Other things have to happen for you to actually care about the information. Uh, maybe it didn't happen to you. Maybe you didn't talk to anybody. You couldn't control anything. All you could do was look around. So while you definitely saw the destruction, it wasn't any more severe. It's essentially what Riley said is that it didn't change the story at all. In other words, if you're making content for VR, you can't just assume that because it's in VR, the content will be different now. It didn't change people's reactions at all. And this is a bit of a surprise to a lot of developers who are like taking content and putting it in 3D. And for the VR folks on the call, you've probably seen this where there's just a lot of really botched attempts where it's like, oh, great, it's a virtual reality spaceship. Is it different than a regular spaceship? No, but you can touch the cockpit and look over here. It's not uncool, 
but it may not be achieving the goals that you're going for. Um, Jeremy is simply asking about what if it happened to you like in an AR environment? That could be curious if you put the environment around where they're standing. Uh, Sam, I, I think you had your hand up. Yeah, I had a, I was, I remembered a game called, I think it's called Edge of Nowhere. It's a VR game, but it's a third, you're in a third person perspective and the camera kind of just follows the character that you play as and you move around like in a normal third person game, but it's VR. And so there's a mismatch. I watched, there. Yeah, I was watching the playthrough and the guy was like, when he was climbing up a really tall ladder, he was like, I shouldn't look down. He looks down. He was like, I regret this. Yeah. Because you're just floating in the air. So it's like really disorientating. Mm -hmm. I didn't play it because I don't have anything VR, but I definitely have watched VR. Things One of the things I that's remember that. To, and it's actually a good feed in is that as we're thinking about these experiences for demonstration purposes, for gaming purposes, for development, we've got to distinguish, and this is going to be, I, I think it actually is our next conversation. I'll look at the syllabus again. We have to distinguish between the place, the space, and the narrative. And I'm going to put a pin in that for later because we're going to have a whole day where we just talk about these differences and why they matter. And it's a really critical thing as we try to simulate virtual interactions. I think the lesson, though, going back, Riley, to product versus process, just because you have an interactive product, I was going to grab my headset, but it's downstairs. Just because you have that headset doesn't mean that everything else is going to happen as a result. Because the player has to perceive all that content. And we're going to talk about the perceptions of space, narratives, and places, and why they're different. Okay? We kind of already talked about this, but we had this scenario where, like, you know, what happens when you have conflicting demands? Anyone recognize this game by chance? Metal Gear. Yeah, so it's a Metal Gear Solid for PS1. And you've got this, yeah, you got this fight where like very well written game, very nice and like very deep game, and especially for its time, 1995, like this was not common to have these like moral parables in these games. Yeah, Dylan Snake, yeah, it's a very common thing, right? So on the one hand, you've got like d debates over the philosophy of love. And on the other side, I'm about to fight this giant robot. And I point this game out because it's one where uh, uh, Kojima takes a lot of heat. Because if you play his games, he's very serious about his narratives to the point where I think his games, oftentimes you are not allowed to skip the narrative. You have to watch the scenes. All 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. go, go ahead. Some of those, I say all 30 minutes because some of those cut scenes That's where I was going, are yeah. Some of these cut scenes are a half hour long. And we're not exaggerating. Like, it's a half hour cut scene and you have to watch it. And from a drama standpoint, they're pretty good, but I just gotta finish fighting robots and I wanna go find more of them. And the game's battle system is pretty good too, but they don't happen together. And they kind of clash a little bit. It's similar to sort of our discussion around quick time events and how like they make sense for what they are, but they can also clash with the game, right? Where you, you know, some people chastise them for not being games anymore. Uh, there's some research suggesting that modern games that have these more serious narratives tend to be easier. They tend to be easier to beat. They have higher completion rates. Why is that? Why would a, a more somber game have a much higher completion rate than an action game? Because they want you to get through the story. They don't really you want, want you to get stuck on something and then not be able to complete it. Right. Nothing's worse than like a really good narrative. But, oh, you're stuck on level 19. Sorry. Sorry. You'll never know. Whereas mm -hmm. I'm thinking of like the beat-em-up game with earlier. I freak, there's no narrative there. I don't care about this. I'm just punching things. I did not know as a kid that Doom took place in hell. <laughs> I remember the parents being upset that you're fighting people in hell. And the kids were like, what are you talking about? I'm shooting that thing. I don't know what it helped. Sure, I guess. You know what we did when Doom's title sequence started and it showed you the narrative? What did we do? Skip it. Skip. Skip. <laughs> like, don't care. I don't need context for this. Um, being a space marine wasn't that important. 
Like, who cares? It's a 3D shooting game. The other one's about Nazis. This one's about monsters. It's fine. And I swear, like, most of us did not catch the subversive satanic uh, messages in the game. Because we're like, I don't know. <laughs> like, I just want to play. I want to pew pew, as Dylan said on the call. Like, yeah, that's exactly what I'm trying to do. Right? These things can conflict. I think this is where a lot of the serious games are struggling. How do you keep the gameplay authentic and tell the story that doesn't cause Sam to lose halfway through because he's stuck? And I'm like, great. There was a serious story. I got no idea. I'm moving on. It's like a cliffhanger, basically. Ghost of Tsushima was good at that balancing act because it's, it's pretty challenging at points but never so much to where you couldn't get past it and finish the story. Some games even have a, a dynamic difficulty adjustment where they'll just sort of like nudge you through. Like, okay, let's try again. Yeah, like after you lose like 10 or 15 times yeah. in a row, Ghost of Tsushima is like, you, do you want to change the difficulty? Yeah, I love the nudge. I love bit, the, like, are you bad at this? Down. Yeah. We will. Oh, oh, we'll get through this. Yeah. With some RPGs, there's, you know, you, there's the leveling system, you know, that mo a lot of JRPGs and other that yes. use. And if you go grind out, you can grind out the levels to make the game easier. Yep. Or you can go just straight through. I know there's a game I played uh, with a really good narrative. Um, Xenoblade Chronicles on the Wii is probably one of my favorite games for the narrative. Um, but I ended up putting it down because I was like, wow, this is, this is difficult. I didn't feel like grinding. So I put it down for like six months and then went back to it and I was like, oh, and went and grinded out the extra levels I needed and went through the rest of the story. But it was difficult because I didn't grind enough. And that's but all examples it, of the player making mm -hmm. sense of the interactivity, finding out implicitly those demand structures and, and kind of playing through them a little bit. And so it's a good example of where some of this stuff might be useful down the road to think what could players do to balance this out, right? Um, I'm going to go kind of quick because we're on the very end and I, I want to make sure we're respectful of time. Um, what's on screen here is actually something that Christina and I are working on. And the short answer here, what you're seeing on the right side is players' um, reaction times in a video game is a function of whether the game was easy, moderate, or hard. You would normally expect them to go up. Like the harder the game gets, the slower the reaction times you get, right? Because you're not doing as well. Slow times mean you're not performing well. Yet somehow at the frustration level, people got really good, really fast. What we think happened here in this particular game is they gave up on the main task and focused on a secondary task because they couldn't win the main task. So they focused on doing something else. Yeah. It's an example. I see Sam Militon on her head. Yeah, yeah. Players are good at like saving enjoyment. And if that means just doing something else, they will, players will sometimes <laughs> literally change the demand curve of a video game. I'll share this paper once it's written. Uh, Christina and I are in the middle of finishing it right now. Okay. Not going to about emotions too much, except to say that emotions are complex. And you can look at these different charts. They're called a uh, circumplex models where emotions aren't just yes or no but it's sort of a how aroused are you and how good or bad does it feel and you can chart people's emotions all around these circumplexes and the point here is just those emotional demands are all over the scale and that's something we've been studying a lot in our research um we can also have social interactions with bots with ais We've actually mm -hmm. done research at tech where you play a video game with a robot partner, like a physical robot sitting next to you. And people respond to that robot much in the same way they respond to a human. So we're seeing these different social characteristics play out, even in scenarios where you wouldn't expect sociality to exist. Because robot or not, I want to beat this game. And as long as the little guy next to me is helping me, great, we're going to do this. And I can share that paper if you're interested. We published it recently. Mm -hmm already showed this model okay that's week one in a nutshell all right um thank you for this actually i'm, I'm really happy with how this went